Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. Tonight, our guest is Analog Man, Mike Piera. Mike, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I know you're a busy guy. You've been in the shop nonstop. Yes, I am. I'm a very busy guy, but I really appreciate the honor of uh, being on your show. Oh, that's awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. And Dave, how's it going? It's going good. We have, you know, we have our candy from Sweetwater. <laughs> you know, this is, you this is important stuff. Atomic fireballs. <laughs> I don't think they've ever sent me those. Do they come standard in the package? Most of the time, they, they mix those with a bit of honeys uh, or some other various things, Tootsie Rolls or something, or <clears throat> mints or... But on my account, like I said <laughs> earlier, but not to the general public, mm -hmm. they only send me atomic fireballs. <laughs> Special. We used to actually send those out. They, they had a screamer brand of that candy. And so every time we modified tube screamers, we put the little screamer candy in there. And I was getting them wholesale. But then the candy company decided that since I was only buying that one candy, that I wasn't actually a vendor and they canceled me, so no more, no more screamers. Oh man, that's cool. What's up with that? I mean, you know, that's still business for them. You would think so, but it wasn't enough. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, wow. Um, yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, I like the sweet water candy. It's a nice little, nice little addition. So, Mike, I'm I'm really pleased to have you on the show. I have heard about. Analog Man products for a really long time. Um, I, I mean, I've, you've been doing this, I think, almost pre-internet, right? Definitely pre-internet, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, was, uh, there was probably a little, like, emails, and there was the mailing lists. Uh, you would get on, like, a vintage guitar racing or vintage car racing or vintage guitar mailing list and send out email blasts, and then there was the Usenet which was oh, pretty yeah. good. There was like the alt dot guitar effects forum, <clears> the <throat> alt transvestite forums, and all those things. <laughs> were just, it was crazy. Wait, how and, would you know about that? People told me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm always talking about trannies, and people always get me on that one. I love the. I, my last quote was, "I love Japanese trannies." When I posted a crazy face pedal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I didn't go over well. <laughs> well it was, no, it was, that was someone else actually who said that they love Japanese trannies. Okay. <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Careful. Yeah. People are very touchy these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you, you care about that about as much as I do. <laughs> yeah, I, <wow>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes and no, unfortunately. Some people can yeah. be a little crazy. Um <clears throat> So, but tell, tell us, Mike, how did you get started in, uh, in doing this? I see some amazing vintage stuff behind you. Yeah, so. um, I've been, a lot of this stuff I've had for decades. And, you know, actually, I, my first pedal that I bought in 1974 at Danbury Electronic Music, um, only a few miles from my present location, was a Maestro Phaser. And I actually played keyboards back then, but I was just, I just loved the pedals and I, I think I used that phaser so much, it was ridiculous. So it kind of made my Farfisa sound like a guitar with some sustain and attack going on. Um, but I was in, in, always into electronics too. My friends would build the uh, Paya or however you pronounce those kits. And, um, wow, and I, I haven't heard that in a long time. <laughs> yeah, those, those were something. I think that they might even still be available. I'm not sure. What kind of um, kits were they? P-A-I-A, -A, I think, something like that. I think they were made in yeah. Hawaii. Like stack in a box and then That and was one, right. They uh, had ring modulators and they had a lot. Actually, I have a ring modulator in my back room that an ex-employee built. You know, it took him like 40 hours to build it and it didn't work. So he said, Mike, here, just take it. Maybe you can get it working. <laughs> so that list, <laughs> that's in our pile of a thousand pedals that I'll probably never get to. Yeah, I was just going to ask, did you ever get it working? No. <laughs> never even looked at it, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. It's it's here somewhere, I know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't even know. I just wish I could find those OC81 transistors that I had 100 of somewhere and I mm. misplaced. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was over a decade ago, and I've combed through this place, and they just – actually, I had like 500 of them or something, and they just disappeared. Wow. Oh. 
someone didn't lift them, hopefully. They must have, because they're not here, as far as I yeah. can tell. That's uh, a bummer. That is a bummer, yeah. Yeah. What that can sucks. You so um, we got a, 61 viewers right now, 63, actually. Um, rolling in. Yeah, people are rolling in. Uh, it's a Thursday night. We, we keep norm- confusing them on the times yeah. so we're doing our show. <laughs> it's true. We're, we typically used to do it Fridays, but we've just been all over the map. And it's really just because we can accommodate great guests like yourself. So, yeah, so I know it's it's hard for people's schedules and everything like that. Plus, it's been the summer and all kinds right. of stuff. Yeah, you know. I've been trying to have band practices every Friday, you know, this year and the last this summer, the last few months, I think last three months, we maybe got two practices and it's just so hard to get people together. Yeah, it is. It really is, especially when you got four or five guys. <clears throat> Everybody has a day job, potentially yeah. a family. Yes. It's like, yeah. When can you get together? What kind of music, music do you guys play? Uh, we play classic classic rock. A lot of the same stuff I played back in 74 on keyboards. Now I'm playing on guitar. Um, you know, we, we play, you know, I like Prague kind of, it's kind of my, my favorite style, but we do everything from, uh, and we have a, a female singer now, so we're learning, having to re- revisit our set list and um, get some more stuff. I'm trying to get some good 90s stuff, because there was some good kind of alt 90s female songs that we'd like to try, like uh, Veruca Salt stuff or something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. It's fun. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Are you guys you guys play out locally? Yeah, occasionally, but since we we kind of lost our keyboard player this summer and everything was was going good, and now we have to re- regroup. And you know how that is; it's always always tough to to keep a group together. But we're, yeah. we're trying. Yeah, it's funny because uh, ironically, Dave um, Mike is located very closely to a client that I go to and I've been working with for like years, like over a decade. Oh wow! So, yeah, in Connecticut. Oh, so, so now you got to go visit, right? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to have to go visit, of course. That's, <laughs> that was like that was. I didn't want to push myself on Mike and say immediately, "Hey, I got to come visit." But, but yes, I, I need to go check out your uh, your stuff. Um, yes, definitely. So yeah, so it, would you could you take us back if you don't mind? I'd yeah, love to so, know. Yeah, I was story. a musician, then I went to college. I, I, you know, I, I never had the talent. I knew immediately that I wasn't talented enough to be a professional musician. Um, and also, you know, I kind of like money. <laughs> and you know, to, even if you have the talent, you can be a professional musician. But love man, if you got money. No, <laughs> it's tough, man. It's tough. I really feel for those guys, which I, I try to help them out as much as possible. The people that are out there grinding away. But mm-hmm. so I went to college to learn to uh, computer software and engineering because that seemed to be a, where all the jobs were at the time in the uh, you know the mid eight early eighties. And but then I always still I played in band in college. I played bass guitar because they had a good keyboard player, and I played a lot of guitar just for fun. And then uh, I started a software engineering job, which took me to Japan. And I was working on semiconductor test equipment. Funny enough, testing all these transistors and things that that I now use in our in our pedals. And when I was over there, I had a lot of free time, so I'd walk around in the music stores, as you know, over there. And the electronic stores are just incredible. And back then was when Japan had all the money and uh, the vintage guitars there were just mm. unbelievable. Um, mm. I got to know pr- some of the dealers over there pretty well. I would uh, either bring a guitar over there or, or send them guitars on consignment because I saw how much they were marking them up. Um, <clears throat> they would actually get dealer lists from y- the huge dealers like Grun and everything before they were being made to... Uh, available in America because those guys would just buy everything. They would just check like every box, ship me. And so it was really easy for the, for the vintage guitar dealers in the day. They would just basically ship almost everything to Japan. And I got to see it over there and fall in love with it. <laughs> and so then I came back here, started buying them, selling them over there. Mm. Then it st- started catching on here pretty big. And it was hard to find guitars. Of course, this was way before the internet. Um, you could even steal things in pawn shops or you know guitar stores people just didn't know the difference the subtle differences that made um the guitars valuable mm-hmm. and uh, and great right. and so, i'm sure it was before they were the prices blew up and everybody started yeah. figuring it out i mean people knew what a, that bursts were valuable back then but still i mean there were still bursts that you could find that people didn't know the difference between that and the Les Paul Deluxe, and they would sell it for $300. But now anytime oh. anybody has anything, they immediately think that it's worth a fortune, and they, right. they, they Google it. Um, 
and find out all the information, which is good in a way. At least people aren't going to get ripped off anymore. But people ask but you can't find the treasures prices. anymore. No, no, <laughs> that's true. You certainly can't. True. The, those pawn shop finds, every you know, that stuff is almost really long gone. Yeah, and it, it was it was great back in the day. I mean, um, Cesar Diaz was a friend of mine, and he was one of the first guys who would go out in in a truck, a van with like GE Smith or those guys, and they would just drive around through these small towns, hit all the music shops, come back with a van full of 50s tellies and oh. tweed amps wow. and just tons of them and tons of them. And GE still has a bunch of those, which is, which is nice. Yeah, he's a great player, my God. Yeah, I get to see him a lot. He plays with um, my buddy Jim Weeder in the uh, Masters of Telecaster shows, which is oh, really? actually expanding a bit. They were mostly in the Northeast, but um, they've been doing some, some traveling tours. I think they were in Nashville and... Uh, I forget where else earlier this month, but it's a fun show. He has different Telecaster guests, different players all the time, and it's just a lot of fun. Is he the lead dude? Yeah, he's kind of the the guy who keeps the band going, and uh, kind of a tribute to Danny Gatton too, who was just like Mr. Mm -hmm. Telecaster. So they always they'll always do a couple of Gatton tunes and pay tribute to him. Right, right, right. Gotcha. Okay, so keep going. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I was in Japan. Then I was buying the guitars here, and then the Vintage Guitar Magazine came out, um, which was still before the internet. But then at least people could go to Barnes & Nobles, pick the thing up, and they had the, the price list on their dealer sales, and, or they could see the ads. Um, it was nice that some dealers actually posted prices. A lot of dealers just didn't even list prices. They would just have the guitars on there. Right. So, um, call yeah, call so, for price, they would right, say. Call for price. Market price, like lobster. <laughs> <laughs> they listen to your accent of your voice to figure out how much you might be able to afford. yeah <laughs> uh, but anyway so yeah so i started um being very difficult to find guitars here that i could sell as a profit so i started buying effects because effects were still not that popular although when you went to the vintage guitar show some dealers might have a tube screamer or something fuzz face behind their booth or a couple of random boss pedals but um there was, yeah, there was a few vintage guitar nothing. dealers. No, <laughs> there was like uh, Garrett Park was a pretty big um, effects dealer. And uh, Heath up at, uh, I think it's Boston Guitar now. He was um, Brockton Guitars or something. And then Teddy from Music Toys on, on Long Island. I think he was Gas Pedals and he was something else before that. And there's still a few vintage guitar uh, effects dealers. There's a couple around, but that was that was getting pretty popular. And so then it was harder to find those. And so I had to fix a lot of them while I was buying and selling them. And I decided to, well, let's just make some. And uh, hmm. that was just the time when other people like um, Mike Fuller um, and prescription electronics were starting to build these things. And we all started out, you know, making kind of copies of the old stuff that you couldn't find. I mean, you, even back in uh, the mid nineties, a TS-808 was $300, which, which is a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so I was taking the TS9s, which weren't even reissues at the time. The TS9s I was modifying in the, in the 90s were original TS9s, um, which either didn't have the right chip or just people really wanted the 808 sound. So I was doing a lot of those. Couple parts, and you're good. Couple parts, that's it. <laughs> the chips. And I would sign every one of those on the inside and I serialize them. There's probably a thousand of those out there that I did you know, on my lunch break at work or at night at home. Hmm. Right. Wild, wild. Whatever happened to prescription electronics? Yeah, unfortunately, he, he folded um, a while back, and I'm not really sure why. It, uh, everyone still likes his pedals, but um, um, it seemed there was a one odd pedal. timing. There was one pedal that he had that now is super expensive if you look up on Reverb. It's like uh, the Experience pedal or something. Yeah, there's, there's one right here. I don't know if I can reach it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did. There yeah, you go. Is, this is one of his early... Um, swirly that's exactly pedals. It. and he had the little american flag on the back yeah because the octave octave sw the swell switch was kind of uh, an unintended part of the circuit which almost works if you know how to, to set it right but yeah, yeah was... eric, eric johnson started using these and he started selling a million of them really interesting yeah, yeah i saw it used to be way back in the day a dealer for that stuff yeah oh, really that's cool. And he he made fact, good... recently. I talked to him. I, I well, I texted with Jack, the the owner. A friend of mine ran into him at a bar. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and a friend that I know ran into him, and then they figured out that he knew me, and 
And then there was this text exchange, and I got his number. I got to give him a call. Yeah, yeah I'd like to know what he's up to. Yeah, he made some good stuff, or at least that thing. I tried it at 48th oh, Street. France was great, yeah. Yeah, at 48th Street Music in Manhattan and uh, a while back. But it was cool. It was definitely yeah. – I, I, sh I should have bought it then, but I didn't. It's basically a Fox Tone machine, but it's, it's tweaked, and uh, it's got the extra – swell feature and it's just a good really cool sounding pedal yeah it was cool yeah. so so take us back so all right so um you decided to start your own pedals and what, what around what, right. what time was that what year um i think i made the first chorus pedal um in the mid 90s um every, uh, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana were huge and it was hard to find the electro harmonic small clone pedals the chorus pedal he used um, and when you did find one, they often broke down because they were made by, um, I don't know, heroin addicts or something. <laughs> the, soldering, <laughs> the soldering was pretty bad, put it that oh, way. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I started making those, and that, that kind of caught on. And um, uh, I don't know why I started on such a, a hard pedal. I mean, everyone was making tube screamers, but that's why I didn't. So back, the, the difference back then was, you know, there was, there was a few – pedal builders and we tried to build something the other guy wasn't doing which was cool if if jeffrey tees is making a wah i don't need to make a wah he's got good wahs um and full tone had his full drive which was a nice tube screamer and so i decided to make something no one else was making and uh we're still making the chorus we have a bunch of different versions now the bi chorus the mini chorus and mm -hmm. it's been improved a lot since then but uh it's one of my favorite pedals still and then um when did the sun face and all the fuzz stuff come around? Yeah, that, that kind of came on slowly because um, our compressor, I think, was uh, because Trey was really huge around, you know, the, in the 90s, late 90s, and the Ross compressors were very hard to find. So we came, up, came out with our compressor pedal, which was a pretty much 100% Ross clone. Um, and now there's, there was a whole, whole bunch of them came out after that. Um, and we're still making that one too. It's been improved five times now. We have up, up to Rev Five, mm. but the uh, the Sun Faces, I, I kind of made a few like random ones for people, you know, basic basic fuzz faces with different transistors. I actually got a bunch of really great transistors from uh, from Zvex from his fuzz factories, which were the wrong gain for his fuzz factory, but mm. they were very good for a fuzz face. So I I would either use those for modifications or I. I built um, sun face pedals out of those transistors for a few years. And then I would just try to get different transistors. And luckily enough, um, I guess it was in the early 2000s, I, I found original batches of the new market NKT275 transistors, which um, are the holy grail, which were in the, the old fuzz faces. Like you can see one over on that mm -hmm. fender amp <laughs> over there. <laughs> um, and uh, those now if you can find one of my original ones with those original NKTs, so those are like several hundred dollars on eBay. Um, and then we got different batches of the NKTs and then different transistors, the Japanese transistors, the Jap Japanese trannies, as we talked about before, nice. um, different kinds of American transistors, uh, a, a, a really fine gentleman from uh, Arizona. I, I don't know if he worked at the Baldwin Organ Company or he had something to do with them, but he had like a huge amount of Baldwin organ circuit boards that had these fantastic transistors for, for building uh, our sun faces on. Those are the uh, American, the 2N type. Um, so we started using those and anything we could find. I've got, I've got thousands of transistors in, in all my different rooms, <laughs> different <laughs> types that we test out and label them, test them in five different ways and hopefully get some that sound good like the, um, the RCA transistors that we started using this year. Um, one of my vendors just sent me 10 different transistors types to try, and I tried them all out, and a couple of them were good, and I liked that one, and uh, posted some videos, and people started buying them, and uh, they just took off. I'm really happy we were able to find something else that people like, so, and they don't have to spend so much money extra for, for some of these transistors that are so hard to find. Well, I was going to say, uh, the trans are all all these transistors hard to find, or are some of them like like you're finding well, are they are they the newer ones made? That we have are all old. I don't, the, the only ones that I have that are uh, currently available are the the transistors I use in our peppermint fuzz, which is similar to a fuzz face, but it's a lot crazier sounding. You can't get that nice, you know, semi clean sound that 
people really like in, in the fuzz faces. Mm-hmm. But the peppermints got germaniums, but those I think are made somewhere in, in Europe. Um, they're the skinny ones. Usually if you see a really skinny transistor with, with a hat on it, those don't tend to sound, sound too good. They're usually made by that company. But in certain circuits, they sound pretty good. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. But our RC, the RCA transistors, I just I think I bought, I don't know how many thousand of them I bought, but um, several thousand. And those were made in the 60s for sure. Um, and they're, they're just great quality. So it's like what happens when all this stuff runs out? I know that's You're what dying. I keep saying, but I keep, I keep finding it for now. And, you know, if I was one of these big companies that, you know, has stuff mass produced and all these dealers, I would have been sold out for years ago, but making them one by one and, you know, by hand and uh, customize the way we do it, we, we can keep them going for a while, but it's, it's really ridiculous. I think I must drive some of these other companies crazy because like with, with our sun faces, we have like so many different options transistors, on-off fuzz pots, power jacks, sundial bias controls, top jacks, side jacks, probably 10 different transistor types. And then within each transistor type, most of them you can choose whether you want low, medium, or high gain. Um, and oh, man. I would anything just go, you want. I would just go, make me something cool and surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't, I I don't want to go through those choices. I should have that box. If, you, if yeah. you're confused, click this box and you'll be happy. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Not a bad idea. That isn't a bad just idea. Just make them what they what you want or what sounds right. good. But right. What I like to uh, tell people is the chef's suggestion. Yeah, well, they're 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 all they're all pretty similar. I mean, you can dial them into all sound, you know, like a basic fuzz face. But you know, if you if you if you play in hot temperature, sometimes okay, you might want to go f- towards this one. Or if you uh, want something extra warm. You might want this one. You might want the NKT red dots if you want something really smoky and dark. If you want something bright and cutting that's going to work at high temperatures, you're going to definitely go for silicon. If you want warm silicon, you might want the BC183, which can almost sound as dark as germanium. Or if you want it brighter to cut harder, then you might want the BC109Cs, which has got a little bit of edge on it, which I really like. I never like my guitar to be too smooth sounding. It kind of gets lost a little bit, like a little bit of edge on there. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Interesting. So, Dave, when you make your pedals, your your stuff that's new, that doesn't have any older. No, I don't have to. No, I don't have to worry about that because what I, I make you. <laughs> is, what I make isn't isn't a, a transistor based fuzzes. So um, that's a whole. I totally understand why Mike does what he does and picks all those stuff but yeah i don't envy you <laughs> you envy me i don't envy you <laughs> that's a it's a tough yeah. it's a tough uh, game and um so it, so you make so you also make the king of tone yeah so what <laughs> yeah, we could spend about an hour talking about that one i got a question so why is it in such limited supply it's not a limited supply. I mean, I make more of those than any other pedal. It's just too many people want them. <laughs> uh-huh. Isn't it? What, what's the back order on that? Like three, two years, it's four years? Something? It's almost two years today. Today I sent out a list, and it's getting close to two years. Um, this spring we actually did really well because um, my shop manager, Alex, um, he started an organic Japanese vegetable farm in north northeastern uh, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And when he was setting up the farm and he, he, it was too cold at night, he and his wife um, would just build King of Tone pedals. And they wow. would bring in like 40 a week or more than that. And that was wow. great. That kind of knocked the list down. But um, now he's farming, you know, like, like I am, like, you know, all day and all night. So he's, he's out. But when it gets cold again, we'll get him going again. Um, but, yeah, I do need to, do need to get uh, uh, some more people helping me in the builds. But the other thing is, you know, as, as you know, I'm, um, I don't really have time to even sleep. So even if, even though I don't have to build the King of Tones myself, every of the 14,000 of those that's gone out, I have, I may not, I may not have played through, but I've checked them. I've looked at the options, made sure everything's straight with it, signed the bottom plate and they go, so, you know, that takes, that takes time. Signing bottom plates sometimes takes me 15 minutes a day just doing that. <laughs> um, 
And, and this is dealing you said with four, orders. Did Go you ahead. say 14,000 pedals? 14,000 King of Tone pedals. Yeah, wow. since I think we started those in uh, was it 2003, maybe. That's pretty, um, su yeah, that's a su successful pedal. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely our most successful pedal, and we could make more, but, um, you know, I'm trying to keep, keep things level. Um, I don't want to rush them. Also, unfortunately, I mean, that's, that's a pedal that doesn't have old transistors in it, but I want to keep them always the same. You know, every, most companies, they'll change things over the years, and people say, oh, I like the first one best. Well, I don't want to do that with this pedal, which is why when I came out with the higher gain option, um, cause I, and a lot of people just wanted a little more out of it. I still left the original version because if I changed it, people would say, I don't like it. I want the original version. So that's mm -hmm. still available. Right. Um, and we're still using the same diodes, clipping diodes, which, um, were discontinued probably several years ago. And we were buying, you know, as, as, when, when DigiKey stopped selling them, I must've bought 50,000 diodes and I thought that would hold me over for a while. And they lasted no time at all because we use, uh, I think eight per, per pedal mm. and, um, wow. diodes are gone. The, uh, the capacitors that we use in them were discontinued probably five years ago. The Panasonic capacitors through hole parts, as you know, mm -hmm. people just aren't making through hole parts anymore. And especially not, you know, these, those kind of specific ones. Um, Which Panasonic caps were those? The little, um, the little red ones. We they don't make the, those anymore? No, they, they stopped some making of them. about five years. You can sometimes find them for sale. I actually buy them on eBay a lot. I'll find the guy selling 100 on eBay, and I'll see that he's got, you know, quantity, you know, t 10 of them. So I'll, I'll buy, you know, 3,000 Ebays from a, from a <laughs> 3,000 transistors from a day yeah. on eBay because they're priced reasonably, and I don't have to go through my suppliers. But the, we use the ECQB, which tends to be large because it's just a uh, – a, a film capacitor and then the the ecq v is a metalized film capacitor so they're uh -huh. made smaller so like, for example the one microfarad caps if you want to use a film cap for that um you use the v's and they're, they're still pretty big but um you know i've got i don't know how many tens of thousands of those i have in stock um i, I keep buying up up when i can and like the 103 caps you know we use I don't know how many of those per pedal, 10 or 12 per pedal. So mm -hmm. I've got to have like a hundred thousand of those in stock, you know, to get through the next five years. Hmm. Wow. It's amazing. So what, what is it about the King of Tone pedal that, um, sets it apart? Cause there I is think, so much demand about it. I think that the thing about it is that it's just, uh, it's easy to use. It's, and it doesn't change your guitar's tone. Um, I mean, the reason I came out with it was because Jim Weeder had been using an old TS-808 for years and it toured him uh, with the band all around the world for years. And it's great. I mean, everyone loves the TS-808, but after a while, that kind of mid-honkiness kind of thing, it can get to you. And, you know, he really, he's been playing that same 52 telly since the early 70s and he knows what it should sound like. And when something changes his tone, he's not happy. So he said, let's try to do something like a tube screamer that... Uh, that would allow a little more low end. Also, he was always complaining about the low end drop of the tube screamer, which is great. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if you've got a Marshall amp or, you know, something that's a little tubby, then that'll, that'll well, tighten right, right up. up. Yep. Oh yeah. You know that for sure. So, um, we, we decided to, uh, we tried some, uh, Marshall blues breakers, those big, big black pedals. And mm -hmm. it seemed like a good basis and the circuit was, was pretty, pretty reasonable. So I did a bunch of mods and, tried different parts and I, I emailed my, my uh, collaborator in Japan, Obayashi, and told him to try this and try this. And, and then with Jim, Jim finally said, you know, I, I really like it. And that's when we had the, uh, the smaller version. It was like, you know, the size of a, of a regular, like almost an MXR pedal. And it was laid out sideways with four knobs at the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, it was version one or version two. And a lot of people still liked it. Like Mark Rebo still uses the version two. He just loves it. He's got a version four also, which he doesn't think there's much difference, but he just said, ah, I love the version two. Mm. And it's smaller for pedal board space. Jim Weeder still has his version two. And when he's taking a small board out on the road, he'll just stick it on there. That's cool. So what are some of the other products that you have? Yeah. Uh, well, we still have the, the, the two I started with the, the, the chorus, which has got three versions. Plus we have the stereo options and like the Sunface, hundreds of options. Um, the compressor, which we've got the, uh, we added the orange squeezer 
Dan Armstrong orange squeezer compressor to the to the compressor and we made the bicomp. We made, started making those in around 2003. So it's two compressors in one box, but they're um, quite different sounding. So a lot of people would just spend a little extra for the for the bicomp over the comp and say, "Man, I love the juicer. I'm using it all the time." So um, that's a really nice little circuit. Mm -hmm. And after that, um, I'm trying to think what came out next. Of course, we have all the modifications we started doing. Um, after the TS9s, we started doing other similar pedals like the Boss SD1. Uh, we modified a lot of those closer to a tube screamer spec, mm -hmm. um, different kinds of clipping options to make them a little warmer or less edgy. The um, DS1 mod. Yeah, the DS1, the orange one, right? Because that, that pedal cool. was, is so harsh. Um, and kind of fake sounding, which works works in some situations, but if you just want a you know classic rock tone, they definitely need a mod. So we would change the chips and a whole bunch of parts, put a lot of those Panasonic capacitors in there and different diodes. And um, I guess that uh, Boss liked our idea of changing the chip because they started using the our JRC chip in there several years ago in in all of their pedals <laughs> before, they they came, <laughs> before they came out with their Waza. And then we would modify the tremolo, which a lot of people are complaining about the volume loss. So we modified the tremolo and not only fixed the TR2's volume loss, but we also um, gave it better tone by replacing all those cheap capacitors with good ones and changing a few of the values. And Boss saw that one too. And they actually put, the, put a trim pod in there and changed them to make them louder the same way we were doing, but without improving the tone. So I guess that'll be their next Waza pedal will be the tremolo. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I was wondering what what Boss feels because clearly there's a whole host of, I mean, Wampler was doing it. Yeah. You know, like you said, I think Mike Fuller. Uh, I don't know if he was doing Keeley. it to Boss pedals. Keely, exactly. This is always the comparison I always had because uh, it, it – it, it used to be mostly, at least in my book, it was either Mike or Keeley modifying most of the pedals. And uh, I, I, I always was like, I always like Mike's a little bit more than Robert's. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, the DS1 <laughs> was cool. I had a lot of clients that had this stuff over the time, you know. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, his, his and DS1 rigs and different. stuff I've done. The, the two tastes are distinctly different. And, um, you know, what works for some people doesn't work for others. So I right. kind of like what Mike was doing with his mods better than what Robert was doing with his mods. But to each his own, <laughs> you know. Yeah, our mods are, are different from some of the others. Is we're, we're really trying to, to make them almost do less, if that makes sense. Not really do less, but sound less like a pedal. Um, mm -hmm. I love the sound of a, you know, if you've got a $10,000 guitar and a $5,000 amp, you, you want to keep that sound. So yeah. we're trying to make our pedals uh, remove themselves um, from from what they're doing and just do what you want it to do. If you want to add gain, you want it to add treble, you want it to add bass, or you want it to do something right. uh, modulation-y or whatever. more transparent. Exactly. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to use that word. People hate that word. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You were avoiding that word? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, but that's so the best describe word. it without using the word, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we do, we do, and you know, working with a guy like Jim, I mean, so many pedals, I'll, 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 I'll give him a try, or people, people are always sending pedals in like five seconds. He's like, it's terrible. It, well, it's not terrible, but it changes his tone, so he thinks it's terrible. He wants to hear his tone, mm -hmm. right? So I always say, I always say, pedals for me. Where like if I plug into it and immediately are like, ooh, you know, I gotta have that ooh factor about it. It's gotta like have a vibe to it, or it's gotta have some well, sort of organic sort of vibe to it. To, yeah. There's so many pedals there. You like you turn them on, and you're like, well, yeah, it's tremoloing. <laughs> it's doing that. It's going womp womp womp. Yeah. But you're kind of like, eh. Uh. I like a little grid or a little vibe to it or a little something, you know, like it's just something. some sort of feel, you know. I think everybody does. I think that's one, one of the things that um, the King of Tone doesn't have enough of is it doesn't have enough of that to, to some people who 
they, they've been hearing all this hype, which is not of my doing. How does how does the con say that on the KTR? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the ridiculous hype is not of my uh, my doing or something like or that. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, they'll get in and expect something crazy but it's it's just gonna make their guitar and their amp it's gonna add that a little bit of compression drive to it and you know if they've got good stuff hopefully it'll really sound wonderful but you know um it it doesn't necessarily make angels go off a lot of people it takes them a little bit of fiddling around with it and then they go to a gig with their band and at home they're thinking yeah you know it might might not have enough low end or something but then they get there with the band and they say oh my god i can hear myself and then their bass player says, man, you sounded really good tonight. And I, I love hearing that. I, I usually get like one or two emails a day from people who are telling me something good about, mm. about their experience with our pedals. And I love hearing that. That's cool. Uh, we had a comment. L. Scott Music said, instead of transparent, how about purity of tone? Oh, I love that. Oh, yeah. Pure tone. I think somebody used that Pure as a tone name. name. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Most likely. <laughs> it's taken already. That's purity fun. of tone. I don't know. That might bother me just like transparent. But. <laughs> <laughs> but I get it. But it's hard. I think when you have a certain pedal like a fuzz pedal, how do you keep your tone transparent when you have a fuzz? Well, that that's a good question. But um, our sun face pedals actually are really transparent. Um, they're very interactive. And they don't take over your tone like uh, certain pedals do. And when you when you back your guitar's volume knob down they get almost you can get cleaner than when the, with the pedal off so the sun face pedal is such a simple circuit and mm. uh that's a pretty transparent fuzz the sun face fuzz is one of the best fuzzes i've ever heard really thank you for wow. for for that for the fuzz face type right it's not going to be experience. the explosive you know nuclear reaction no. kind of fuzz but it just has this really singing beautiful thing about it Huh. Yeah, and it's not that easy to get because you know that's that's about the the transistors. You know, there's so many transistors we could use, but you just lose that. Um, when I, when I'm testing them out, I'll plug them in my little socket, and I just can scratch the strings on the guitar, and I'll know within two seconds or if these transistors have any hope. You know, once mm -hmm. they're biased in and stuff, and I hit the strings, if I don't hear some harmonics coming through, and I don't have some sustain, and it's like, nope, next. <laughs> don't waste my time. <laughs> Wow, so that, I, mean, I imagine you go through a lot of a lot of parts that are like, uh, yeah, that's, that's I've gonna... got I've got piles of um, parts. That's uh, that's tough. <laughs> so basically, what you're saying is you get too much work to do. You're telling me. You're telling me. That's why you know <laughs> you it's, keep it's, it's tough doing it this way. To you know, I've got. Two, we got this new thing. Uh, the Bad Bob is another pedal, whoops, which I took over from um, um, RGW Electronics. Um, and we came up with a dual Bad Bob for someone just to try it. And the, the first one overdrives the second one, which, which is pretty cool because they're clean boosts, but a Bad Bob is not a clean, clean boost. It's a dirty, clean boost. Mm -hmm. So you hit the, the first one up nice and loud and turn the second one down. And you get some really nasty fuzz out of these. And I've got two that people ordered with some custom options that my guys can't figure out how to do and i've got to do them but i just can't get to them because it's 11 30 at night and i'm tired and it's like nope they'll have to wait till tomorrow <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean there's only so many so many hours in a day yeah yeah so but we're trying to make sure nothing goes out of here that i wouldn't want to keep on my own pedal board oh that's cool so what's like the wait time if someone were to send you, you know, like, oh, I have this MXR pedal. I want it to be modified. Like yeah, that's another thing. We do. We mod a, a ton of MXR pedals. And we even sell those new with our mods, like the um, custom shop phasers, the phase 90, phase 45s. I love those. Um, and basic mods like our Tube Screamer mods, Boss mods, Ibanez mods, MXRs, True Bypass mods, Wah pedal mods. Those get turned around really quick. Um you know a day or two my mod guy is really efficient at getting those out and you know we know when people send something in that they want it they want it back so they can use it so those kind of get get priority and i mean we've gotten some that have go actually gone out the same day but that that's very rare the next day is not rare and the second day is probably average gotcha that's good do you guys do mods on um like 
flangers like like some of like if you had a newer newer mxr flanger you can make it sound the problem is that the newer um a lot of the newer pedals are just made with the surface mount devices and everything's mounted on the board and there's they're even hard just to take them apart um mm -hmm. so we can't really modify those but like the mxr custom shops are made just like the old ones and gotcha. those are very easy to modify but like the old mxr flangers like um we do a lot of those they came with the ac cords which are kind of a hassle on pedal boards these days because people like to use an integrated power supply. And also having AC cords on your pedal board can be noisy and dangerous and things. So we'll pop the AC cord out and we'll put in an 18 volt power jack on mm. those um, to make them a little bit easier to use, plus true bypass, plus LED. And uh, we'll do a lot of those kind of mods. Well, that's cool. Yeah. yeah you gotta get, the trans gotta get the little transformer out of there. Yeah, and they hum like hell sometimes, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they hum because well, just too close to well, if you know, if you're using it into a totally clean amp, you're not gonna hear it. You're using it into a cranked up amp or a dirty amp. Right. Uh, you're gonna hear it like <laughs> mad, you know. And if you're at church, you can actually hear the pedal humming if the amp is off because the damn transformer will be sh will be shaking yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Exactly. Yes, yeah. so I've taken a ton of those out too over the years. <laughs> yeah, we just cut cut a couple of wires off the transformer mm -hmm. and run a run a regulator in there. And um, I think Jeff Beck uh, was the first one we did, and he wanted it done. I'm saying, sure. <laughs> so now it's a now it's a standard. Model. I guess I'll do it for you. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so how'd you meet Jeff Beck? I won't I won't pass over that. Um, I think through his his guitar techs actually back in the uh mid 90s or so um uh mike clement who also worked works with uh black sabbath he also works with jeff beck and a lot of those guys and he needed some like boss sde 3000 you, you remember those rack units mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. i bet he needed some of those and their office was in new york so i would find those for him and other random things and uh send him some things to try every now and then Sent him some of our big T Telecaster pickups to try, and hopefully he'll try those sometime. <laughs> Dave, don't you have those uh, those SDE three thousands in your rack? Oh yeah, <laughs> those are fantastic, aren't those they? Those sound um, can't touch it. The closest thing that comes to it is uh, the new Boss DD five hundred. They have a, they have a repl replication of the SD SDE three thousand in it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty close. I believe I looked on eBay recently, and those are not going for a lot of money for some reason. The SD oh, 3, no, that's three hundred some dollars. It's that's crazy cheap. I mean, to build yeah. something like that today would probably be twenty. It was a thousand bucks. new. Yeah, back so in, like, back then, that's like twenty five hundred bucks in today's market. Yeah. I'm thinking somebody should no, just the, buy one. <laughs> they're not going yeah. for that much. Um, yeah, you can get three fifty. I think is the average, but. Um, so cheap. Not much. They're great. They're great. And um, yeah, the pedal goes for more. Wow. Yeah, they stopped making the pedal when the pedal oh, was no, available. I, I was. I'm a dealer for Korg. And well, not uh, the, no, that's oh, the SDD. Not, okay. That's the SDD three thousand. That yeah. pedal was pretty cool too. That, by the it way, was, and we couldn't cool. sell them when they were available. But when they stopped making them, we sold out, and everyone wanted them again. Yeah, everyone wanted them soon. Oh, what they don't have them now? Okay. You know what I appreciated with that pedal was you just looked at it though, and you were like, "Oh man, this just looks cool. <laughs> it looks like the old delay." Right, it had that vibe. We jumped ships here. We jumped. We jumped from Roland to to, to Korg, but <laughs> uh, Mark's probably like, wait. Which delay are they talking about? Yeah, I, I I was lost, but that's okay. You guys yeah. were you guys were on a roll, so I wasn't. All these room. letters and numbers. That's R2D2. funny. Both 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 those delays are excellent. Yeah, uh, different different reasons. Does the core go for more well, money? I think the yeah the original Korg I think does go for more money. The, the original Korg SDD three thousand mm. uh, was a, a delay that the Edge used, uh, uh, kind of made famous so to speak. And the cool thing, cool thing about those if you use them in front of an amp is they have these uh, input level and output level switches. Mm. And you can actually like preamp into the into the amp a little bit, boost the amp a bit with them, and the and the circuit in them sounds really cool for doing that, even if you have the delay off. And uh, so those those were a lot of people would use that into the front of their AC thirties or things like that. It was it was great, nice, really cool. So, 
So going back to what we were talking about before um, about modifying the MXR pedals, I was thinking about picking up a GD, I think it's a GD10, the graphic equalizer, 10 band, old style. Oh, MXR? the old one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it the MXR? G10s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, no, Boss GE10, the big one, right? Is it is it Boss who made that? The big one? Yeah, the, the big one, the G, uh, GE10? Yeah, yeah. G, yeah, it's Boss. Okay. Can that be can that be modified to not have the 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 wall cord? I'm sure it could, but yeah, that's that's a good pedal. I think that was one of the secrets to uh, Andy Van Halen's sound. Um, yeah, that was I a think good he pedal. Used those, um, but yeah, you should be able to do that to put a power jack on it. Probably okay. would need at least 18 volts. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. All right, we'll be talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I wanted to run that, Dave, with the uh, with the 50 watt plexi. Oof. Yeah, the, the the G10s are great. Even if you just run through them, and even if you're not using the EQ, just a little bit of bump on it, it just sounds sounds better running through it. It's like you don't you don't want to change that one. It's just like wow, it's better. <laughs> it's a big pedal. Yeah. There's no I mean, are there other better other other alternatives today that sound just as good as that? Or no, that... Mm -mm. Yeah. they're trying. They're trying, but they're not getting it. The digital delay guys are, are coming out with new digital delays all the time that are getting better and better, but it's it's tough. Yeah, but I, no, I'm talking about the uh, the the equalizer, the graphic booster. Nothing touches that one. Nothing sounds yeah. like that one. That that's different. Yeah, it's actually that's a particularly great sounding one. It's very th thick and warm sounding. I guess I don't know how, how else to put yeah. it. Just hmm. does something. It's like I said, just running through it, you're just like, wow, I like my amp better now. <laughs> it's, right. It's one of those things. It was just like you know. I remember I used to have an old years ago an old Phase Forty Five pedal, the original one. Um. And I had this one amp that I swear, and no true bypass. This was before that. So I swear to God, this pedal in bypass in front of this one particular amp, that's the way I liked the amp. <laughs> I always had to have that pedal. And I didn't even, I, like, I wouldn't even use the pedal. Just I wanted to plug through it. I've heard <laughs> Robin just amp. Loading, just the loading that it was doing to the amp, it was just sounded great. That's well, some people liked the old Wah pedals because uh, an old Wah crybaby or Clyde McCoy yeah. totally suck your high end away. Mm -hmm. And for me, I hate that. I want you know, I want my get through. But some people liked that dull tone because it was so warm. Mm -hmm. So in, here's a question, um, and then we'll we'll hit the chat in a little bit and get some of the questions there as well. Um, so if you buy a you know, uh, I don't know, a custom shop, MXR custom shop phase 90, right? Um, what, and, and I have one and I think it sounds great. And I also have like the, the, you know, the EVH one phase 90 that they have. It right. doesn't sound anything like the custom shop one. Yeah. It's you know, the 74. Yeah. It's the script. Yeah. It's the script one. Script 70. The w Script with the power jack or without? Uh, it does not have a power jack. Okay, you get the seventy four then. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That is so, made just like an original one, except metal film resistors. Right, Mike? Uh, I can't remember, but probably I think that's probably all they use these days, right? Yeah. The funny thing is that it seems. I think circuit wise, it's correct. I'm not positive on that, but I'm pretty sure circuit wise, it's correct. It's built the same way. Yes. Same lift out board and wiring and everything. Yep. They um, even put the same date code on the pots. Yeah, the pots look like a cool. 74, which is cool, but also it confuses a lot of people. You know, the funny thing is, though, I've, I've AB'd that many times to the originals, and it's basically doing the same sound. But there's something a little more sterile than the original one. The original one has this little gooey factor that... Mm. that and I often wonder... If it really, because the original ones, generally speaking, had carbon resistors, a lot, at least some of them did. Later, they either carbon had car film. carbon comp or carbon film, yeah. Yeah, some of the early script ones are carbon comp. Right. I have a few of those, and uh, I was always wondered if we changed out all the resistors on the board to carbon comp, would it be the same then? <laughs> 
that would make a difference, but to really make it the same, you know, all the, to, I think that's got, it's, it's a four stage, it's probably got four FETs in there and they're probably a little different specs from the original ones. Probably. That might make a difference or more, more likely the, uh, the capacitors and the chips, you know, cause every, all those things add up. All yeah. The capacitors might make the tone a little different. The chips, not too much. I think they Carbon use Carbon resistors to some extent. Yes. Yeah. The resistors definitely, yeah. um, at least in but the audio path. ceramic capacitors, whatever they used back then, or they used a lot of uh, tantalum capacitors, which are those little yeah. like, octopus-looking things, and they used those because of the MXR packaging to fit those pedals in that little box was was quite an amazing feat, and they had to use tantalum capacitors to fit them mm. in there. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because the uh, the difference in tone between that seventy four. And the EVH, even when it, it has the script mode on it, they, they, it just sounds so vastly different. <laughs> I should send you one of my older older ones, Mark, and then you can then you can go. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> really? What? what you know, it's, it's, the it's, same yeah. amount of difference, but you, you see on the Eddie Van Halen when they put that little button there, which calls it the script mod, and a lot of people will say on the internet, "Oh, you cut off C14." I don't remember what the number. You cut off C14, and it's a script. Well, it's not really because the circuit is different. All you're doing with that quote unquote script mod is um, removing the feedback so it doesn't get quite as squish as swishy. So it sounds more like the old one, but it's really not mm. the same. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it just doesn't it doesn't cut it. So what I basically did was I, I used a uh, an adapter because of course it, it doesn't two things about that pedal is it doesn't tell you that it's on. There's no light indicator. Mm hmm. Right, and then also it's only battery driven, so I just use one of those adapter things that goes onto the battery. And right, I plug it, plugged it into my board, so but it's a great sounding pedal. Definitely. Well, then you can also notice it sounds different on the battery. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, might. Uh, unfortunately. A lot of pedals do. <laughs> and you know who pointed that out to me? Who's that? Eddie Van Halen. Wow. Really? He's got good ears. Mm -hmm. He does have good ears. This was years ago. He goes, listen. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, sure what? enough, when you listened, you're like, mm, you're right. It's, it's, you know, it's like relatively close, but it... it there's a difference. There's, on, on certain pedals, there's a little bit of a difference with the battery versus a power supply. Yeah, especially on the old fuzz pedals, um, mm -hmm. even different different batteries. You know, people would think Eric Johnson was talking about batteries in his tube screamers, and he was crazy. Um, tube screamer, there might be a little difference, but I don't know, it might be more due to the actual voltage. But in a uh, fuzz face, the battery is like a serious part component of the circuit, and mm -hmm. uh, the other things like the inductance and the capacitance of the battery and things like that will actually change your tone and you plug a, a ever ready black cat battery in there and uh one of these guys and you'll get um nice mm -hmm. amount of high end and then you plug a duracell in there and you'll lose a little bit of that that crispness um, so it's very interesting that is interesting it's not something you really want to go down a path of <laughs> <laughs> the rabbit hole you will yeah. drive yourself insane <laughs> well, it's also the whole debate about nine volt versus eighteen volt. Well, that you know. makes a huge difference in certain things. Um, certain pedals, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our, it, in most pedals, like dirt pedals, what that does is it gives the op amp so much more room to work with, so it gives you a lot more headroom. And like our king of tone pedal, some people really like it a lot more on eighteen volts. But if you're using it kind of dirty and you want like you know more of a uh, nasty sound, you know, nine volts is might might even be better but some people who want maybe have both sides on and kicking them hard with a humbucker guitar you know to get all that signal through there 18 volts is really a good solution to, to help that circuit hmm. chorus too the, um some two pedals that we make actually our, our chorus pedal and our compressor pedal both have chips that were designed for 15 volts as their um ultimate voltage for example the uh, delay chip in the chorus pedal is a panasonic chip and it works at nine volts 
Um, but at, at 12 volts, it's going to give you a little more headroom. And at 15 volts, it's like really happy. Um, and the compressor also has the CA3080 chip, which the old Ross compressors and Dynacomps had. In, and that chip also is spec'd to be really happy at 15 volts. Um, the chorus chip can probably be fine at 18. The compressor chip, 18 is kind of the hairy edge. I haven't heard of anybody blowing it up at 18, but I usually tell people to, you know, use 12 if you if you have the choice because 18 is kind of on the hairy edge for the compressor. But that that helps both of those pedals quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You can fry a pedal though if you go. With the <laughs> well, depending on the pedal, everything's different. So, and yes, digital especially. <laughs> people will a lot of times ask me, you know, can I run this pedal at higher voltage? Can I run this? And the answer to almost any digital pedal is no. If it's digital, no, because um, digital volt things usually run at five volts, so they have a regulator on the inside that regulates things down to five volts. And if you put nine volts in there, it's pretty easy. It has to dissipate some power. It gets a little warm. You put 18 volts in there, and first of all, you may be exceeding the specifications for the regulator. It wasn't des designed to run that high. Or even if it, the regulator is okay, it's going to... Re release so much heat that it's going to fry something and uh, digital pedals do not like higher voltage basically <laughs> interesting yeah yeah i'm sure i i know i i fried a few pedals here and there i just had the strangest thought and it's going to probably be sound so stupid but i i imagine you go to nam mike have you been to nam i have but i can't i can't deal with having a booth there i will have I won't be able to sleep for days. I'll have people asking me questions and I hate marketing and I hate, I hate that kind of thing. So I, I if I go again, I, I like to just walk around or if I have a booth, I won't have any pedals. I'll just have a margarita machine and just come and hang out and sit on the couch <laughs> and I'll have pretty girls to make you margaritas. That's the way I would do it. <laughs> I, don't want to sell, I don't want to sell shit. <laughs> I don't like marketing. Here's my catalog. <laughs> What was funny, what, what, as you were talking about digital, I thought to myself, well, you're analog, man. I'm like, I wonder where if digital man is somewhere at in, in NAM. Both of you guys run into each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like something would that would happen hole. at, at Comic-Con. Um, we so we sort of did, did a, a sim similar idea, but uh, we have a sound room, which is good mm -hmm. and bad, depending on how you look at it. One, it escapes you from the world a little bit. Two, you get your ears blasted off. Um, <laughs> but we counteracted that by putting a bar in there. Ah, uh -huh. so nice. so we we actually have a a, a bar. So <laughs> Which yeah. this this past year Take was the very nice. The <laughs> yeah, the bar and the and the pastries. Those freaking pastries were so good. <laughs> I've thought about those pastries since that day. Yeah, I still don't know who someone in the organization. Someone's family member just brings them every year. I don't know who brings them. They just wow. show up. They were so good. I know they're from Porto's Bakery, and you know, like two boxes of these little dough wrapped in uh, inside with apple inside with like this dough wrapped around. Like, yeah, yeah. But they were crunchy, and it was just oh man, it was so good. Yeah, uh, they didn't last very long. No, it, it, it definitely not. I'm but taking no, I, notes uh, next to my margarita machine. I'll have some of those. Yeah, pastries <laughs> in the margarita machine. <laughs> Portos was it? <laughs> Portos was it? Yes, that's the that's okay, the bakery. I'm taking notes. And that's, uh, that's funny. Yeah, and th those are quite good. Yes. Uh, I was I, in, I was in heaven when I saw those. I was like, oh, man. Or you can just come visit and come visit our booth and then have a drink and have the pastries. <laughs> that will work. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Nam is fun. Um, so. You don't work on any any digital stuff at all, I imagine. Well, we do a few mods like the uh, the Boss digital delays, like the DD3, which is a great sounding basic delay. We'll add a high cut switch on there if you want a little warmer. Um, the DD5, we added that has a reverse mode, and I think it was their first reverse delay, but you couldn't get just reverse. So right, um, you added the dry kill, right? Exactly the kill. Yeah. Yep. Um, did a bunch of those and. Uh, that. Other things like expression, expression control jacks, digital pedals. The one thing I like about them is very easy to add expression control jacks because most of the potentiometers on a digital pedal are just control voltages. So you just put an external jack in there and you can plug a Boss EV5 pedal or anything like that in and control things externally. So that's the one thing I do like about digital pedals. 
you don't have signal going through the pots, basically. Right, right, right. right. Has, uh, has any of these companies ever approached you about the mods that you make to their pedals and say, hey, we're interested in incorporating this onto our pedal, or they just kind of steal it? I'm just curious. Um, they pretty much steal it. Uh, I actually had a, had a guy who, when I was out at NAMM several years ago, we met with these companies and talked to them about it. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't think they want to spend the amount of, you know, the money when they uh, can can do their own thing like, like Boss came out with. Um, and Ibanez had some of their guys actually here in, in this country um, came out with, like, their TS9DX because, you know, they were hearing about different mods and, it's not really like a mod. It's just different different modes, uh, more low end and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, other I'm thinking of other companies, but um, yeah, we haven't. We uh, other sometimes people will come to us. Like um, New Sensor came to us, so I've been a dealer for for Electro Harmonics, and I've known those guys for forever. And you know, they wanted to make a good tube screamer. So who do they come to? <laughs> they come to the guy who uh, wrote the book, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, anybody can make a two screen these days. The stuff is on the internet, but they just wanted to make sure it was done right. So I gave them the correct schematic. I told them exact part numbers and sources for the parts to really make it sound good. Um, and then they laid it out and uh, it came out great. And uh, hopefully they'll, they're selling a ton of them. Um, I had I had thought that they would, you know, put my name or, you know, something in the ads about it. But right now they're just kind of, you know, if, if you ask, I'm sure they'll tell you that we helped, but they're just, it's a tube screamer. That's all, that's all they care about is that it's right. But I was hoping that they would, they would try to promote it um, mm -hmm. with us a little bit, which they still may do. What company is it? Electro Harmonics, New Sensor. Oh, okay. Mike Matthews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what's the pedal called? It's called the, uh, well, the Soul Food is the Klon. This is called the East River Drive. Hmm. And their factory is right on the East River. Right, right, right. Oh, that's cool. I see it that. from Manhattan. Yeah. So the East City Drive is just basically a tube screamer. It's a TS-808, exactly. And it's reasonably priced, and it's true bypass, and it's a good little pedal. So, yeah, so that I guess that brings us down the rabbit hole of there's so many tube screamer-type uh, co you know, copies out there. Oh, um, my God. It's, like, insane. And I, I even I was recently was at I was at Sam Ash or somewhere I think it was Sam Ash and I saw the Maxon 808 next to you know various Ibanez models or whoever it was and I'm like oh, maybe I want to get the Maxon I couldn't make up my mind so I was just like I walked away and was just like forget it <laughs> well at least Maxon was the original company that made the 808 so <laughs> right it did so right. that you know at least at least you're it, it's their heritage, so to speak. Right. I figured right. I was getting close, but I wasn't sure. So, so like, what would you recommend? Like if someone was going to go out and they want a good, you know, real good sounding tube screamer. Well, any of the um, original style tube screamers, like the TS-808 reissue, the TS-9 reissue, the Maxon OD-9, which looks just like a TS-9. Um, any of those are great pedals because they, uh, they're basically handmade. They have, um, a circuit board with normal parts on them. They've got potentiometers with wires on them. They've got switches with wires, jacks with wires on them. You can run over that thing and, and we can fix it. Anybody can fix it. All mm -hmm. the parts you need for that pedal can be bought from Small Bear Electronics or Mouser or any place. Um, whereas some of the other, you know, like the cheaper that some of the Chinese, some of the Chinese pedals actually are, are made like that and can be repaired, but other cheaper pedals, everything is on the circuit board. Everything is surface mount. If the jack breaks, there's no way to replace it because only that jack will fit in that pedal because it has to be mounted on that circuit board. Mm. And so basically those kind of pedals are disposable. If, if you step on the, the uh, input jack, it's broken and it's landfill. Um, whereas the TS9, you break the jack, put a new jack in there. You just unscrew it, put the new one in there. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what sounds closest. Yeah, okay. Well, once, once you've got one of those, they were made by the original company. They used the original circuit board layout, and the parts are pretty damn good. So you just take one off the shelf. It's going to sound, you know, 95% the, as good as a $500, $600 TS-808. If you want to get it a little closer, you know, we can, we can do the mods. The new ones don't use 
the same um, kind of capacitors um, that the old ones used. Um, that makes a difference. Uh, the chips they use are, they're using now, they finally started using the right chip after over a decade of making the reissues <laughs> with, with a really bad sounding chip. So mm. that, that got them pretty close, but you can make, still make them a little better. That's cool. I love that stuff. Yeah, I can't, I'm, I can't remember where I've seen, I saw your ads way back when, but it was definitely, it might have been in Vintage Guitar Magazine. Yeah, Vintage Guitar Magazine was, was where we started um, with the vintage guitars. I would run my ads in there with the list of guitars with prices, and the, I had a lot of vintage pedals in the ads back then, too, that we would sell. And then we started doing the two frame ads. I ran, ran an ad for that. And, um, so I'm sure you saw them in there, and it's still a great place to advertise. It's a, it's a, it's a great pub publication. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Are they digital, or are they still just doing it? Um, yeah, I'm pretty paper. sure they, they they went digital, but they're you know I still just let, have the magazine. Yeah, I haven't picked up. I used to have a stack, you know, <laughs> just a giant stack of those magazines, and uh, I finally just had a setup, you know make some room. <laughs> I just gave uh, a few friends uh, a giant stack of Guitar World magazines and Guitar Player and Guitar Techniques, and I just had to free up a bunch of space. I'm sure everybody's run into that. So That's for sure. But um, let's see. We've got some questions. more. Yeah, more guitars says, Dave, your buxom boost in the loop of my dirty Shirley conjures Satan himself. F <laughs> Effing awesome. <laughs> I had I to read that. that. I should put that quote on. Okay. got to yeah. put that quote somewhere. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll send it to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy it and send it to you. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. No, I like it. I like it. That's what it caught my eye. There were a bunch of other comments, but I was like, okay, I have to send that one to Dave. All That's right. a good uh, one. <laughs> So, all right. Should make a T-shirt out of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I just sent it to you. Um, I mean, I'm going to go through. We our first in the chat was Tom Brino. What's going on, Tom? Um, and more guitars. Awesome. Been waiting for this episode. I've I've had more analog man pedals uh, than than it, than it cuts off than Frode. <laughs> And food fried. I'm not sure what it says. Um, and then, oh, from Friedman pedals and amps. I've had more analog pedals than Friedman pedals and amps. Well, Dave's not going to be happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, question of how many Friedman amps he has. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Usually, uh, one is a pretty good amount. I yeah. run into guys that often have like three or four. Nice, amazing. Yeah. Well, I've last got two. Guy, last guy well, I ran into, I ran into it at Nam in Nashville, and he he told me how many he had. It was some huge figure, and I'm like going, you know, just email me. I'm sending you a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have noticed that, uh, and that includes you, uh, Dave. Is a lot of amp companies are making pedals now. Whereas, um, you know, ten years ago certainly wasn't as common. Now, yeah. there's very few that that aren't and i think it's because like like i said you know a lot of people have one amp but pedals are so much easier to have multiples of and yeah they, they sell they sell so fast so it kind of, kind of makes a lot of sense to to branch out because you've got the customer base and you're already an electronic manufacturer and you've already got good ears and you might probably want to make some pedals that sound good with your amps right yeah or or with any amp um you know like the the beod pedal was a huge success for us Really, it's a high gain Marshall style pedal in a in a in a box and plug into any old clean amp and it's gonna turn it into this raging high gain beast. Beast, you know. Um but the idea behind that was hey, you can take this and if you have a backline gig and you have a all you have is a fender deville to work with. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you need the tone. You need like a Marshall S tone or some some sort of high gain Marshall kind of tone. That's the idea. It's like, well, you can take this and I, you can do something with it. <laughs> you can even plug into the effects loop return and it'll work as a preamp. So, wow. 
So it'll that's high gain. It's not not necessarily one that works well with distorted amps. Um, right. Although yes. you can tame it, so it will. Um, it's a little gain trim in the inside of that pedal. You can take it down to nothing almost and use it more like a boost into into stuff. Um, but I, then I developed like a boost pedal, which is more like, oh yeah, you got a distorted amp. You want to boost it a little bit, EQ it a little bit. Here you go. Mm. Boom. Nice. Yeah, that's always a good good pedal to have. And then there's a few other like little things that are coming out, and we had, we did some tube pedals. I um, that were, you know, tube pedal. Here's the thing: tube pedals don't sell. Tube pedals. <laughs> Tube pedals don't generally sell. I think you're kind of right about it's that. A, it's a, a few standard do, but... thing. Maybe they're too big. Uh, you know, they draw too much current. I just, they don't generally sell that well. The funny thing is we have an amazing fuzz pedal. That's a tube fuzz pedal. Really? With a kind of like a crazy switch. It'll send it into oscillation and do all sorts of weird shit. Um, but... It's not selling, guys. Buy some. They're great. They're really good. <laughs> I yes. mean, it's, it's a particularly great fuzz pedal. Um, it's not a fuzz face. It's not really anything. It's like uh, it's got its own little thing to it, but it's it's really good. Someone was asking about the new tube. Have you checked those out yet? Yes, yeah, so I looked at those a little bit. It, it's it's. I don't it's know. It's technically interesting, but it's I don't know if it's that useful. I'm not, yeah, I'm not so sure it's useful either. It almost seems slightly gimmicky to me. Well, didn't Ibanez just recently put it in one of their... Yep. Yeah, we have the, the new tube screamer, um, which you is, shows you the little tube at, 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 on the top. And um, they're actually pretty cool. It's quite a different sound from a regular tube screamer. It's uh, a lot... Um, it doesn't have as much compression and um, mid-ranginess it's a little grittier so it cuts through a little better if you want that kind of sound and the thing i found about it was at nine volts it's 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 okay but when you run it at 18 volts it really gets that tube happy and all these electrons are flowing and um it sounds cool. pretty cool that's interesting oh. very cool dave i'm gonna have to order a fuzz fiend <laughs> Get it soon. Okay. Yeah. Get it soon. <laughs> Get it soon. Before it's discontinued? <laughs> no. Um, um, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'm going to get one. I also want to pick pick up a uh, Sunface from you, Mike. So uh, Come on like up one. and you can try them out and see which one uh, you fancy. That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, let's go into the chat again uh so we've got um dry heat says hey guys guitar wannabe what's up craig he says hello uh gt tv guitar tv what's up everyone just found this channel today thanks for joining super fuzz hey mark and dave um i'm gonna skip around because i don't want to say hi to everybody and then keep a, our guest bored um but i want to find a fr i want to find some questions um i don't know if anybody else saw any questions Good i'm looking gtv said i hope to own a friedman one day um let's see okay okay please talk about those amps behind you mike l scott music <laughs> sure um if i can figure out how to do this uh, over here i've got the yeah. uh acoustic 360 bass amp um Got two of those. Actually, there's another one in the back room, and I have an extra head, too. But when I was uh, in high school playing in that band, um, all the good local bands had these. And I remember standing 50 feet in front of this guy playing a Rickenbacker, playing some good, you know, like Deep Purple or something through that. And my pants were shaking. I'm like, man, someday I got to get one of those amps. <laughs> and sure enough, I did and put it in the shop here. And I'm plugging, I'm plugging into it, and I'm playing playing it through my jazz bass and uh, I'm like it, it's pretty loud but you know man I remember being outside and having my pants shake and it doesn't seem that loud and then my uh, I hear this crashing sound and my my shipping area is over there and my whole shipping shelf 
and all the shipping material fell down because the whole building was shaking and it knocked it down. So then <laughs> I guess it was loud. <laughs> <after> <laughs> uh, and then let's see, next to it, we got, uh, got a, uh, a Tweed Champ, I think from like 1960, all original, sounds good. Oh, under here, I should have taken the uh, cover off, but there's a 58 Deluxe, which is mint. And that, that's just a, oh, such nice. a great sounding amp. You can't beat them. Mm -hmm. Underneath it, which you almost can't see, there's a, there's a Supro down there. Oh, yeah. I saw um, the legs. Yeah, there's a Supro. Mm -hmm. And then next to it is a 66 Super Reverb, which the, uh, the guys from that pedal show had plugged in when they were coming here. And I bought that amp from an organ player who played in wedding bands and things like that, who I had seen his band play like in the late 60s and 70s, like a bunch of times. And he probably played through that amp. And I saw it uh, in a newspaper or something, and I bought it from him, got the speakers reconed. It just sounds fantastic, as, as you may have heard on that pedal show. Mm -hmm. I haven't checked out that episode, but I have to. Yeah. Oh, you have to. It was fun. <laughs> and then on top of it is a Vox uh, Conqueror, Conqueror head, the, uh, the one the Beatles use. It's solid state, but it has a built-in fuzz which is really cool. It's very similar to like a tone bender. It's got, mm -hmm. I think, three germanium transistors. So I got that from somewhere in Eastern Europe somehow. And that's a cool one. On top of that is a, a, the Pro Junior. The Fender Pro Junior was used by Jeff Beck for, for several years. And um, those are great. An off the shelf amp. Yeah. yeah those are cool. It, and I, I actually have it running through the Marshall cabinet, the bottom cabinet, <laughs> which really makes it sound big. Um, those amps are, are a little tricky though. The volume knob when you there's like nothing, and then you get to like three, three and a half, and boom, it just like takes off. And if you go beyond that point, it's too too much distortion, too much compression. So you mm. have to find that little notch. Um, yeah. At least for me, because I don't if if I turn it up to four or something, my delay will get so accentuated right. because of the compression and the amp I'll be able to use it. Yeah. But sometimes when you want an amp that's distorted, you can use that and, mm -hmm. and crank it up for testing things. Um, then so you got the Marshall fun. 20 water up there. Actually on the top of the Marshall is a, it's called a uh, reverb fuzz unit. It actually has a small reverb tank in it and another three transistor tone bender um, that Marshall put in there kind of similar to their, to their, uh, Marshall Super Fuzz, but a little different. And I actually cloned that one, and it sounds pretty good. But um, maybe someday we'll come out with it because nobody else has yet, and they'll all come out with everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so I'm confused. So that head actually is a fuzz? The head is a fuzz pedal. With fuzz reverb. reverb. It's the biggest. Yeah, it's one of the biggest fuzz pedals in the world. Holy shit. And it sounds pretty cool. The reverb doesn't sound good. It's just a small, um, probably like most, most Marshall reverbs, it, it's not a great it's sounding one. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never had a Marshall with reverb, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, that is no. It's just bad. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's wild. I thought that was uh, like an old PA 20 water head or something like that. Yeah, I wish it was. I love those. Um, Mitch Colby's making some, some of those small park heads like that now. I might just have to check one out. Yeah, the little 20 watt parks. Yeah, those are cool. Yeah. yeah also, um, isn't Fryette doing the Sound City? He's doing Sound City, yeah. He's doing. Um, he has a twenty. He's doing a smaller one too. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it was a smaller little cab. I'm not sure about the head. But, yeah, um, great. yeah, really cool. Um, Lefty Mike H says hello from Central Illinois. Modded Tube Screamer from Analog Man in 2003. I love it. Uh, and GTV Guitar TV. I'm on the King of Tone waiting list. Um, You're in good company. Do you have people who are like, oh, man, why why am I waiting so long? You have people complaining and shit. I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot of people who uh, don't really know why we have the list, and they just think it's stupid. And, and I, I can see that too. If you if if you if you're not in our shoes, it, it does seem kind of stupid and, and pointless. But um, you know, we've got the list. I've got to stick to it. Uh, some other people, um, who was it? The guy who made the, uh, up in Canada, those shiny tones are pedals or something. I think he had a list and he, I, I know why, cause it's such a hassle, but he just ended up dropping it and he's selling things when he builds them. I, I'm not sure, sure it's him, but I think it's him. But, um, you know, I could do that, but 
there's thousands of people on the list and that would piss off so many more people. I, and I think it's fair doing it this way, this way um, we can make sure that people aren't flipping them. Cause that was another question I saw on there. Somebody asked about people reselling things on reverb and stuff. We have people who have bought 10 King of tones from us and sold them all on reverb or eBay but we didn't realize it at the time because they were tricky. They would use different email addresses or things. Mm. But now I have um, analog Amy and she's, she's a good detective. She finds these people who are ordering multiple pedals and you can tell these people, they don't need five King of Tone pedals. They're selling them and they're making more money on them than I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which isn't quite fair, but I mean, it's a, it's a free market, but we want the people who are waiting to get their pedal as soon as possible and to make it a, an easy experience. So anyone who's had four pedals in the past and she finds out about it, we just give you your money back and you know, thank you so much. But actually the ordering email that we send out when you reach the top of the list, it tells them that if you've gotten four, please don't order another one, it'll get canceled. Um, so you know, that, that's kind of why we have the list and mm. it, it, is, it is a hassle. I mean, I used to spend you know, half an hour a day just on list administration. <laughs> oh, it's man. Crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> That's all I need, right? Oh, God. That's all I need. But, and those dual bed bobs sit over there unmade. <laughs> right. That, that, that's not what you need. That is not what you need. So tell us about some of the um, famous artists that have worked with you and on your pedals and stuff. Yeah, I've been, I was really lucky to, to get into the, the business when I did and um, have a lot of uh, great artists and their techs and their managers contact me. And I've always you know, done my best to try to help them out because that's the one thing I really enjoy best in this business is um, seeing some of my heroes using our, our pedals and uh, getting to check out their shows and mm -hmm. uh, like hearing them play the pedals backstage, things like that. It's just, it's just so much, so fantastic. So I've always, um, always enjoyed that back from even before I had analog man, I was doing the guitar shows and dealing with certain people. And like I mentioned, Jeff Beck's management and, and deep purple. Um, I mean, uh, black Sabbath. So like I did modified tube screamer for, for Iomi back in the, in the mid nineties and, uh, gave him a course, sent him a chorus too. And actually, you know, he, he bought them, and I just found out years later that he was still using that tube screamer and he wanted another one from their, for their tour that they did a few years ago. And sure enough, I walked up to the stage and I looked in his rack and there was our little green pedal with the red analog man stamp up there. So, you know, that's great. And seeing him up there playing it. And I know every time he hits this, he goes for one of those solos, man. That's, a, that's my tube screamer singing up there. I love that. Yeah, that's amazing. That's very cool. And what other, a lot, a lot of these new bands that are coming out, there's some, some great players in, in this area. I'm, I'm so happy to work with guys like um, you know, Scott Metzger and um, all these guys who are from Woodstock, New York City. There's so many. My, my, my mind is going blank, but um, mm -hmm. all these guys are, are great. And for example, we had, uh, had two bands visit me on, on Sunday. Um, Taz, uh, Neumbauer. Um, stop by. He's a 14 year old uh, kid from Long Island with a um, amazing talent. He was uh, on the original School of Rock, and uh, he's played with everybody on big stages all over the country. And he sat, you know, right here playing, playing all all my pedals. And you can check out his uh, his clip I made of him on on my Facebook page, Instagram. I think I saw it. I think I saw it. Yeah, yeah. he's just and he plugged it. And, you know, it's, it's so cool watching some of these guys, and you can tell that they've got it because it, watching him play, it brought me back about 20 years ago when I was at Lenny Kravitz's house. Mm. And Lenny was checking out a bunch of electroharmonics pedals I brought for him. And the uh, difference was Lenny had a joint that was about a foot long, but that was the only difference. <laughs> but their heads, their heads were still in the same place, even though I don't think Taz was – was was doing anything but they started playing and then you could see something click in their head and like lenny lenny had this lick he was using like an envelope filter or something and he was like playing this lick over and over again like and then he started like, humming and singing and stuff and it was so cool just getting into his head and 
and uh, Taz the same same way. Brandon, Brandon was playing some of these licks, and I could tell he was just really you know he was thinking about something there, and something really cool was coming out. Mm, yeah. And then after Brand, when Brandon was here, um, another band came in, um, Heather <laughs> Gillis, Heather Gillis and her band came in and they were heading north and Brandon was heading south and uh, Brandon's uh, other guitarist kind of set it up and didn't tell Brandon about it. So it was kind of a surprise visit. Mm. And so they were all here checking stuff out and he took some pedals. I, I modified some pedals for him while he waited. I fixed, I fixed some pedals for him. And then uh, he went home from some pedals and then she sat down. She had this beautiful old Rickenbacker lap steel um, she was playing a bunch of pedals and her, uh, her bass player checked out the peppermint fuzz and he was wailing on it with guitar and he bought one of those. And so that's just a lot of fun when we get to hang out with, with some of the bands. Totally. Yeah. Lenny Kravitz is, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Lenny Kravitz. Did yeah, he end up, talented. did he end up taking any pedals? From oh him? yeah. He, he pretty much wanted every electroharmonics pedal. And I had some really pretty rare ones. I didn't sell them all the, the rare ones. I, I tried to keep, keep a lot from my collection, but mm. um, I must have sent him, pro I must have brought him about, I don't know, 15 pedals, you know, micro synths and deluxe memory men. And mm -hmm. uh, if you hear, I want, uh, I want to get away, fly away song. He's got that weird little envelope thing in the middle. I'm pretty sure that's a Dr. Q that I sold him. That, was, that little funky riff. Mm. But yeah, he bought a bunch of pedals. Yeah, he loves the vintage stuff. Oh, yeah. And going into his place, this was, I think it was like on Third Street or something in an old um, uh, brownstone in New York City. And he was setting up his studio there. And he had the Beatles recording console there in his house. He had the Hammond organs, the Mellotrons, the drum sets, um, and the guitars, his wall of guitars and amps. Amazing. It's just amazing bursts and flying v's and you name it it was just it was insane unfortunately yeah. he's not there anymore but uh, it was great to have seen that yeah where'd he move to i think he's in the islands now or something he, right? well he went to miami for a while and i don't know where he is now yeah, yeah but yeah. his he had a he actually had a british um engineer there because they were kind of close to all of the crap in new york city the empire state building and all the broadcasting and they were getting too much noise too much radio signal so they had this guy completely seal the building including the doors with like foil like uh some kind of steel foil and we were in there and he's playing his guitar and, and he he's hearing this little buzzing sound he says ah, i hear that that noise and then the guy goes over to the door they had this big giant door and he like slams it closed and the noise goes away it was like a tenth of a millimeter open, the noise was getting into the room. <laughs> and I think he finally gave up because you couldn't couldn't make a quiet recording there. Right. I don't know how the other New York studios do it, but maybe his building was just in a bad place or it had bad power. Hmm. I, I don't know if this is a direct question, but um, did you work with Joe Bonamassa on any pedals or anything? I haven't actually worked with him directly, although I'd love to. Um, and I first met him back at the... Uh, classic American guitar shows in Dix Hill, Long Island. Did you go to those in the nineties? No, no, no. Oh, those those were a blast, man. And, uh, he was playing there when he was really young. But I did notice when he plays with uh, that uh, funk party band, they're they're fantastic. I think that's that's the, the best stuff he does, in my opinion, the stuff I enjoy most. But he's playing with them, and he had one of my mini choruses on his board, so I was glad to see that. Mm. And I know him, him and his dad have known about my pedals for, for a long time, but I'd love to, to work with him and help him out because he's not a pedal guy, but our pedals are for guys like him that don't want to change their tone. You got right. a $200,000 guitar. You don't want to lose that tone. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's funny. Um, we had a question. Lefty Mike H says, Mike, what was the Kenny Wayne Shepherd mod? Yeah, well, the Kenny Wayne Shepherd mod is actually not a tone mod. But um, Kenny, you know, back in the 90s and still to this day, he tours heavily and he kicks his pedals and there's people on his stage and his, he would send me his tube screamers every few months because they broke. And we, we find out what broke and made them so they don't break anymore. Um, one of the bad designs of the tube screamer is the power jack on the TS9. It sticks out a little bit. 
and the power jack is mounted directly to the circuit board. So if you kick the pedal in, in that point or it hits something, it's going to break the board off of the mounting screw mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to get your plug in there and you're going to think the pedal's broken. So one of our Kenny Wayne Shepherd mods um, fixes that so that doesn't happen anymore. Also, the potentiometers in a, in a tube screen or TS9 or 808 tend to get loose. And when they rotate, the lugs, one lug might rotate and touch the next pot and short out. Yeah. When that happens, it's not going to work. So our Kenny Wayne Shepherd mod also keeps those from rotating. And yeah. also the input and output jacks tend to get loose. And if they get loose, they can break. And that's another thing that our Kenny Wayne Shepherd mod does. So it's not a tone mod, but it's a, it's a touring mod, a heavy-duty mod. Oh, interesting. He's a great guitar player, too. What was that? A bulletproofing. Exactly. Or uh, dumbing down or something like that. <laughs> Have you, um, you know who just came into my head? James Brown. Have you checked out, have you seen hit the Amp Tweaker pedals? No. You should check them out. Um, he's got some really cool, uh, like, little innovations on his pedals that I really like. Um, like, especially the one that, that I, where he has a button if, you, if you're using a battery mm. and you don't want to unplug your pedal because the battery is going to drain down. It's a, just a, a, a button on the pedal that you can turn the battery off. Yeah, that's a good option. We actually have that on our, uh, our fuzz faces as, as an on-off volume pot. So you basically turn, turn the knob, volume knob down all the way, and it clicks off. Um, and we can also add toggles and other pedals, but that is a, a good feature to have. We have that in the peppermint fuzz and all of our fuzzes. And I have that on my peppermint fuzz on my board, and I put a green sticker on it that says, turn me off. I never turn it off. But the battery <laughs> in a peppermint fuzz or a sun face will last, last forever. I'll leave the thing connected for a week. I'll come to my next band practice. It's fine. And then I, I still forget to turn it off. I come back the next week, and it's still fine. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Why is that? It just has low, power, low juice. Yeah, it doesn't draw that much current. When you're not playing through a fuzz face, it really uses – when you play through it, it uses a little more, but it's still very little. And actually, one, one odd fact about batteries is that sometimes a little bit of trickling out of them is better than if they're completely disconnected. I'll, I've heard that. I haven't proven it yet. <laughs> hmm. Gotcha. Um, so we have Wyatt Willis says, love the demo from Mike Herman's on the Boss DS1 with Analog Man's Pro Mod. Never thought I would lust, out, lust after a Boss DS1. <laughs> Kudos to your talent, Mr. Piera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love that mod because that, that you know, the pedal has great promise. The original DS ones were pretty good, but then they uh, the bean counters got in there and they changed the chips and they changed the parts and they just don't sound that good anymore. And nowadays, uh, they really made them cheap. They use a, the whole circuit board is like the size of a big postage stamp with surface mount parts on it. We can't modify those anymore. Um, they're kind of going downhill. Gotcha. Um, is it John Simmons, is it hard to make a Leslie-style pedal? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, they've been trying for years. The original Univibe was, was meant to be a Leslie-style pedal, and it does some of the things that a Leslie does. But if you think about the uh, acoustics and mechanics of what a Leslie does, it's, it's not just a pitch change. There is, there's a Doppler change, and actually one is coming and one is going. When it's coming mm. towards you, it makes the pitch higher. When it's going away, it makes the pitch lower. You've got that. You've also got the amplitude modulation, which is louder when it's facing you and softer when it's facing away. And then you've got the bouncing around kind of reverberations. And you've got the, the upper rotor and you've got the lower rotor and some, some Leslie's. So uh, it's very complicated. Um, there are some people that are getting really, really close now. I think there's something called the Ventress that people – people seem to like a lot hmm. um, our, but for for a fast course once it starts spinning pretty fast i mean our our anal, any one of our analog man choruses especially if he's got some mix, mix knob on it you can get a damn good fast chorus out of it but once it starts going slow and you're hearing the low whoosh and you're hearing the high thing and all that that, that gets pretty tough mm -hmm. gotcha okay um Let's see. Oh, by the way, there were some people who were saying they were having trouble loading the page for some reason. I'm sorry. 
uh, I think it's your problem. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's your, yeah, I think it's your your issue and your because we're good. Uh, Sean Tubbs was in the chat. What's up, Sean? Hi, Sean. How are you? Sean, try out a analog man pedal. Please. Yes, you should send Make him a one. video. <laughs> yeah, you should send him one. Yeah. Sean, Sean's a great player. Great. Uh, um, yeah, let's see. I'm trying to look. Uh, oh. So was there a comp? Did you work with Kurt Cobain, or someone said there was a Kurt Cobain story? I thought you just said that you were working. That very was the that was the chorus that we came yeah. up with to satisfy all the Kurt Cobain uh, wannabes and people who yeah people who wanted to get those sounds. We came up with our chorus, but um, I didn't make any pedals before before he died. I don't think I don't remember. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, you would know that, right? <laughs> Um, Simon B has Mike ever thought of making a batshit crazy pedal like the Korg Miku pedal? <laughs> What's the Korg Miku pedal? I, I That's a great pedal, man. The, I've never the, even heard the of amount it. of technology in that pedal is insane. It does the vocoding thing. It does uh, it does the different um, voicings, and uh, it just makes you, your guitar sound like a Japanese anime character oh, wow um it's just insane and it, it comes up with random japanese uh phrases and words um you, you got to hear one to, to believe it it's 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 pretty insane that they could come out with that and expect to to get their money back but maybe <laughs> they maybe they use that technology for something else and they decided you know we've got the technology so let's stick it in a pedal Korg doesn't exactly have the best track record with coming out with pedals and making them a success. You're absolutely right. And being a Korg dealer, I look at my shelves and, you know, they make good stuff, but it, it's just they don't know how to make what people want in the styles and sizes. And then they don't, when they make something that they want, they stop making it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but their tuners are great. You know, I love their little uh, pitch black tuners. We've got. Yeah four or five different versions of the pitch blacks and uh, whoops. And they have their, um, they do make the Vox hand wired uh, wah. We still sell, sell those. We modify those with different features that people might want. That's a, a good sound. They still make a hand wired one. Yeah. It's complete. It's the only, it's real completely hand wired. Mm. I think it even comes with the clear bottom plate so you can admire their hand wiring. Hmm. So speaking of Waz, Dave, when's your stuff coming out? Any updates on that stuff? Yeah, the Waz end of September. Those are such a hassle to build. The <laughs> mechanics. Uh, I don't want to build because we we just built our chorus in a Waz shell, and you know we didn't make many of them, but it was always a hassle getting those those shells. Well, to you got to adjust right. it right, and you got to make sure it's adjusted properly before you even ship it, and. But just the, yeah. the hardware and making making everything fit. Whoever designed the original Wa, you know, you know, for his first design, it was a good job. But then people people are still using that original 1967 design, and it's just uh, it's got a lot of flaws in it. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, there's it's a tough. few updates in ours. You know, you can adjust sure. the tension, adjust the tension with an Allen screw. You know, it has yep. an LED. It has a bypassable buffer on the output. Perfect. Uh, so you can use it as a pedal board buffer if you'd like. Um, and for use in front of fuzzes, it's, it's great to have that buffer on. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it has like a little three-position sweep switch on it. It just widens the sweep and gives nice. it a little more gain. Um, and finding good switches that work in those kind of enclosures is, is also yeah, tough. And then, I f and then I found some good... Um, Found a good inductor that I liked. I just like the tone of it. I tried a whole ton of inductors, and boy, all the same value, all different. <laughs> you know, uh, amazing. So yeah, we actually got a really great inductor from Mercury Magnetics. I was uh, working with one of their guys, and they sent me one to try, and I was like, oh man, it sounds fantastic. It's like fifty dollars or something for the inductor. <laughs> so how are we going to put that in a lot? You just can't do it. <laughs> Sorry. 
I guess we no. could. Some people yeah. would buy it. Our customers would probably buy it, so maybe I should. Five hundred dollar wall. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, here's like the price you if you want it, guys. Right. If some people would pay for it, you're not going to sell it to everybody. That's for sure. Got a question about the Fox Rocks uh, Captain Coconut. Can I take that one? Yeah, go for yeah. it. Yeah, that's nice that you saw us down at the uh, Great American Guitar Show. We went down there with, uh, with Dave Fox, and I brought Jim Weeder down there a couple times for demoing, and my Japanese collaborator, um, Obayashi-san, he came down there f with me once, and I remember we introduced the Captain Coconut down there, which uh, I kind of helped Dave with. I mean, he, he did all the designing, but, you know, since I was – you know, very knowledgeable about those things. I, I bounced a lot of ideas off with him and the captain coconut is basically the three Jimi Hendrix effects in, uh, in one big box. It's got the right. uh, fuzz face, the Octavia and the Univibe. So, um, he built them all in one box with amazing power supply and conditioning and filtering and really nice sounding circuits. And, uh, he sold them for a pretty reasonable price. I think they were like three ninety nine. Um, which was a great price for that kind of a unit. And they even had a nice uh, the second version, the Captain Coconut 2. He tried to make it a little easier to build, and it had a fuzz card on it where you would have this little uh, board that you could stick on headers so you could put in a silicon fuzz card or germanium or hybrid. Hmm. And uh, so I would, I would make the NKT275 cards for his, for his – or maybe I sent him the transition. He built the cards – but we would offer them uh, as a Fox Rocks dealer. I would offer my customers, you know, different fuzz cards for those. And there are still people out there. I probably every, every few months, someone will say, hey, Mike, can you make me a fuzz card? And I'm like, uh, I don't have any left. Sorry. But, you know, maybe Dave can. And actually Dave came out with some um, new, new Captain Coconuts. They may even be available on his website. Now, last time I was there, I saw he made up a couple more and they're, of course they're a lot more money, but, um, they have a warranty from him. So, you know, they'll work rather than spending $600 for one on eBay that you know, you're taking your chances. Hmm. So it's basically Hendrix in a box. Exactly. Yep. And, um, I actually have something similar to that in my pedal board. I took one of the wedge shaped Dunlop, Dunlop Octavio pedals and put our fuzz board in it. And then I put a chicken salad, Dan Electro Univibe circuit in it. And crammed it all in there with um, all in that one box. All in one box with virtual batteries because there's different polarities. The the fuzz and the uni uh, Octavia are positive ground, right. and the Univibe is negative ground. So I have one power jack that goes into it that powers everything else through virtual batteries, and um, that's my own little middle gym, mini Jimmy. Of course, it doesn't sound as good as Dave's. It doesn't have a real Univibe in it with the optical light and all that, but. Uh, for me, I use it a couple, you know, a couple show, a couple songs a night. It's it's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Why doesn't someone come out with the experience pedal again? Well, I think Full Tone makes a. Um, he has Ultimate two octaves. Octave. One Ultimate Octave. Mm -hmm. One That's of them the is the vendory. one of them is the Fox, and one of them mm -hmm. is the uh, the Octavia. I'm not sure which is which, but the Ultimate Octave is the uh, Tone Machine style. Okay. That's it. Um, and then the uh, Octave Fuzz. Octave Fuzz. Is the uh, type of Bray. Right. Octave. Right, so his is, his is probably pretty close to the experience. It doesn't have the swell feature, which is kind of a, um, not a very real useful feature. I never knew anyone to use it. <laughs> but didn't the experience pedal have like that backwards feature where you can make it sound like Well, it's that's funny. sort of the swell feature, kind of. Okay. Yeah, what it does is um, certain fuzzes, they will gate out like a noise gate when the bias is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then if you hit the note, um, it'll kind of come in. So what that swell does is it's kind of, it does something to the bias so that uh, your initial attack doesn't come in. It kind of swells in. Maybe it charges a, a capacitor up to get that bias there. So it's pretty cool. But to get it, as, as, as Dave said, nobody really uses it because it's really hard to dial in. Uh Gotcha. Okay. But it was a great idea. I think it's a cool feature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was definitely cool. Um, Eddie Van Hendricks, cool name, uh, has a question. Has Mike considered outsourcing his manufacturing, such as boutique amp distribution? Yeah, that seems to be the, um, 
the biggest change that I've seen in the last several years to, to guitar effects. You know, I started out, there was the small guys who built, you know, stuff in one small room, like me and probably Prescription, some of those guys, like Way Huge. And then Full Tone. Full, well, Full Tone, yeah. And then he started keeping the same model and ideas of building them himself, but hiring more people and making more pedals and um, distributing them wider. But nowadays, a lot of the companies, um, Midwestern companies, do that. They'll just outsource the, the builds and uh, even designs. And they're basically kind of a, a marketing company. Um, we could get a lot more pedals built that way, but I really like to uh, to keep the quality and keep keep my fingers on everything. And you know, I, I don't I don't want to get too too big. I don't want to get you know too too many pedals out there that we have to keep track of and take care of. And I don't really want other too many other people building our pedals. Um, so you know, I, I've thought about that. I almost you know I talked to like John Cusack for for a minute about building our. Uh, like our bi comps for a while, we didn't have anyone here to build our bi comps. Yeah. Um, and I talked to s another company in the, in the Midwest who builds pedals for several of the the large, larger, larger small companies. I don't know how to say that. I can't mm -hmm. call them boutique companies, but you know the. That's you the know company, talking about. company that makes uh, warehouse speakers. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Great. Great guy. He 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 actually also sells enclosures. We got some enclosures from him. He powder coated from us and stuff, but. Um, and he he did build us some some circuit boards and stuff, and they were great. But now I've got another, a new guy here who's doing a great job in the buy comps, so and the comps, and uh, so we're doing those here again. Cool. Um, uh, as John, long as you're happy and it's it's good, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, as yeah, long as you're, you you you're comfortable in the amount of money you make or comfortable in the, your business, then that's the way you should keep it. And as I mentioned before, I don't like marketing. I don't like hype. Um, and you know, in order to sell, I'm really lucky right now because we really don't run ads and I'm still selling more pedals than we can make. But if I got into the marketing and stuff, I could get them outsourced and have them built. But um, yeah, that's not, that's not the way, way I want to go right now. I just want to keep small. And it's like, yeah, I could make more money that way too. But how much money do you need? Some, some of these guys are making you know millions of dollars every year personally um which is great for them but uh, i don't need that much money <laughs> yeah it depends I, I don't i don't know too many who are making that much money <laughs> but there are yeah, a few no, most of them there are a handful yeah. of guys in this country that are making millions of dollars every year which is which is great for them maybe mike fuller well he's been um, making a lot of money for for many yeah, a long years time, yeah many years he's, he's doing a great job and his stuff is still handmade and Good, good, good quality stuff. I've always had, uh, yeah. always had respect for him, and I hope it's mutual. And what about um, electro harmonics, though? A lot of that stuff has gone overseas, right? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know how much of their stuff is 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 really made here. Um, but you know, you know they're, they're doing a good job, man. They come out with some really interesting pedals when when they first came out with what was it the I don't know if it's the Pog first or the Hog. They came out with that technology that allowed them to create the harmonies and then the micropogs and the organ pedals and those the, the technology they come up with and the tones you can get out of those are <clears throat> just fantastic and is all that stuff analog or is it some it's of all digital? digital it has to be digital we tried that in the 70s some companies tried to make analog harmonizers and they were, i've got some like even tied harmonizers from the 70s and they're really cool but um they're really expensive they really are hard to fix and um, the new ones are just so much better. Gotcha. Koozie, analog man Koozie. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, John Sims, what's a good compressor for rock and metal? I don't know if you would use a compressor for rock and metal music. Well, I definitely for rock. Clean, more clean, but... Yeah, I mean, me personally, I I use... Comp anytime I'm playing, playing clean, I'll use use a compressor. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, if I want to get more sustain, like playing leads, like the way you know Trey Trey uses his Ross compressor and his his uh, tube screamers, and it just it just gives you a beautiful sustainy sound for uh, for rock. And if you listen to that clip I was talking about with Brandon Taz when he was over here on Sunday, he had my compressor pedal which he bought going into his Prince of Tone or King of Tone into our delay, and 
it actually even brings out some some different frequencies because stacking pedals, which has really gotten popular lately, does more than than the sum of the parts. When you hit a king of tone with a compressor that's that's boosting your signal, and especially as your signal dies out, you get these great harmonics and and things, and you can after you've plucked the note with bending and things, you can just really get great control. Um, that's how, and Trey also has got the hollow body guitar, which helps with the sustain, but um, definitely using a compressor with, with rock is, is, uh, is nice. Um, I don't personally play too much metal, but um, I don't think it, it would be that useful. I think you'd probably end up getting too much feedback and noise because a compressor does add noise. Mm -hmm. um, but if you stack it right, you know, into a king of tone or something, you won't really notice the noise. You just turn it off when you're done playing. So you mentioned Trey again. So how much work have you done with him? I've been um, working with Trey for a long time. Uh, one of his, um, I guess he was working, he was writing with his writing partner in, in a studio in New York. And the guy who owned the studio had, had some of my pedals. And he mentioned that Trey was coming. And I said, yeah, let him try him. So he had one of my original compressors, which was before we handmade the comprosser, we would take the Dynacomp reissue pedal and we would pull a bunch of components out, change all the transistors, um, and then make it into a raw circuit. And he had one of those there, and he had one of my modified tube screamers there. And um, so he used it for writing and recording the session, and he liked it. So I hooked up with his uh, tech, Brian Brown, who unfortunately has left him this year, but he's been with him ever since the, the 80s, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Hmm. And uh, so Trey, Trey used two tube screamers. He used our Silver Mod tube screamers for years, and hopefully still will again occasionally. But he likes likes using some old tube screamers occasionally or some clons occasionally. Um, and uh, he actually used our compressor um, on a, a previous tour for a while. And I listened to that tour and it just sounded fantastic. It was really a nice, a little more clarity in his tone. But, you know, he likes the old Ross. And one reason I think is because his fans bought it for him. So he's, he's such a nice guy. He, d he doesn't want to disappoint his fans. Those, those guys got together and bought him a pedal. And it's so mm. cool of him to, to use it like that. So, it, it, so he, I don't mind him using that over my compressor. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I mean, they're on tour right now, aren't they? Yeah, they sure are. And also, you know, he he pretty heavy user of the Whammy pedal. I think the Whammy 4 it was. He sent us some of those to fix. And some sometimes they just can't be fixed. So he said, I'll oh, just keep them. So I'll get some of those in my my wall of fame over there and Mike Gordon from fish also would send us pedals to fix and, and uh, things like that. He, he likes those um, funky Italian envelope filter things that I can't remember what they're called. Red things. Those are always going out. Hmm. Hmm. What about the whammy pedals? Cause I, some, I saw someone ask before if they were ever going to make a better version of those. Well, yeah, the version that they make right now, I believe it's called the Whammy 5, but they don't really call it the 5 in the package. It's called a Whammy or something, but that's a really good one. Previously, the Whammy 1 was always the best, and I was always trying to find those to people for people. I brought one, actually, when David Gilmore was doing his on, on an Island tour, he was playing at Radio City, and I brought one of those to him because um, they have to have just the right sweep on him, and his was getting worn out, so I brought one of those to him, and other yeah, people the, new, the new one is good with the little switch that goes from classic mode to yeah. the other mode. It sounds great. And then and they the make the thing. new little ricochet pedal, which oh, is a whammy, pedal? like a little tiny whammy yeah, uh, there, with uh, a other, foot switch that, that just to, goes to a predetermined hmm. uh, point. Like when you step on it, it just goes up in pitch, yeah. or, which is great for a little, if you need that sound and just need a little small little pedal. And the great thing about the new technology whammies is they're, they're polyphonic. The Whammy One, if you try to play two notes through it, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> yeah, but right, the, uh, exactly. the new Whammy Five, you can play a chord and you can pretty much slide it up almost like a steel guitar and just mm. slide it up to the next chord. And it's, it's really impressive and it tracks pretty well. Whereas after the Whammy One, the other ones didn't really track too well. But some people like that. Some people like the Whammy Four because it does kind of a glitch thing when you, when you track. And yeah. Trey, always, Trey always liked that Whammy Four. Hmm. That's cool. 
Um, We're pedal geeking here, guys. <laughs> that's totally. what we're all about. That's, that's yeah. Life. That's why I, I wrote pedals, pedals, pedals. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Mar March just listening and listening and like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I get some of it. It's like, some wait, it. what pedal? <laughs> <laughs> the ABC two thousand. Um, let's see. Hey, I'll be right back. Sure. Sean Tubbs wrote, "Wait, there's a bar at the Freeman booth." Yeah, bro. You need to come, Sean. We need to see you there. Um, let's see. He also mentioned that that uh, swell mode on the experience pedal of his useless. I saw that comment. Thanks. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, Mark, when are you back in Connecticut? Call me, Jim Becker. Uh, I'll be out there in a few weeks, actually. Um, I have to go to Connecticut, uh, excuse me, to uh, Philadelphia this coming week. Uh, but I'll be back out in Connecticut in a few weeks, so I'll definitely call you. Um, let's see. Oh, someone wants to know about the Friedman Celestians. And then under that, hey, Analog Mike, did you ever have any part in the Captain Coconut with Fox Rocks? I think you already answered that, right? Yes. That's the I'm, I'm seeing a different list of questions, or maybe you're – oh, you must be on top of me. Okay, I'm at the very bottom. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm scrolling down now to the bottom. Um What's the best pedal to release harmonics from different frequencies? Well, that would have to Diego. be a dumb, dumbbell pedal, wouldn't it? Diego Fuentes. Uh, because uh, electrons cannot survive in a crystal lattice. It would have to have tubes, <laughs> according to, according to Dumble's quote, which I believe he, he did jokingly, and people, people took it literally. Oh, really? <laughs> but may, I don't know if he was, if he was talking about that, that, uh, that Dumble thing or if he was being... Uh, it was an honest question, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but like like I mentioned, the compressor does kind of have a harmonic balloon to it because as your note fades out, it increases the gain and it lets all the frequencies through. But any good boost pedal um, will have good frequencies in it too, as long as you don't lop off that high end, and as long as you, you know you have a, have a good circuit in there that doesn't sound cardboardy, you should be able to have some some good frequency harmonics come out okay um ben coon says i'll stop by the booth at nam uh yeah buddy we'll see you there uh vinny what's going on vinny mark when you're in philly i'll come see you if you have time i will uh i'll text you bro i'll let you know um let's see best chips for a sun face by they bill mean, strange yeah they mean the transistors someone had replied uh, actually a guy i know well replied the mkt red dot and that's a good one um the red dot is a germanium transistor and it's very warm little dark little smoky sounding um it gets pretty pretty clean but it doesn't really have sparkly clean it's kind of just a a, a little bit of a gritty clean which is kind of cool if you want to you know, have that bluesy sound um, the mkt is really good then the rca which i mentioned before <clears throat> That's a, a brighter germanium. It's very bright for germanium. It's uh, um, very clear sounding, very clean cleanup, very bright kind of cleanup. And the great thing about the RCAs is that they work reasonably good in higher temperatures where the, um, the NKTs, I just had someone email me yesterday that they're playing in, in LA and it was, I guess it's pretty hot there and it was 80 degrees and the, their sun face just wasn't sounding good. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, it's not, the NKTs are not going to sound good at 80 degrees and the 85, they're going to sound really bad. Um, so, you know, they might've been better off with the RCA transistors. Hmm. And then there's all the other ones. I was talking about the Baldwin Oregon transistors, the silicons. Um, they're all good. You just have to kind of figure out where you want to go. Uh, what, what parameters are most important to you and uh, choose from there, but you can't go wrong. We're not going to sell you a transistor that doesn't sound like, a really, really good fuzz face. Awesome. Um, Jim Becker had a question. Since we're talking tube screamers, Digitech Bad Monkey, what is the big deal? Is it a digital simulation of the tube screamer? I've not heard that. It's not. No, it's it's just a basic overdrive circuit. I don't know how close it is. I I don't think it's a tube screamer clone. Um, I don't. But it does sound very similar, and they were really cheap. 
and they sound pretty good. Somebody mentioned they sounded really good as a boost, but not really when you turn up the overdrive, which is, which is probably true. But, you know, if you're, you know, a kid and you want to, you're just starting to play guitar and you just, you want something a little bluesy sounding, um, it's a great, they were, they were a great option. I don't think they're made anymore, but I don't think that they were magical at all, but, uh, they were quite good for the price. Mm. Yeah. They were relatively inexpensive, right? Probably 30, maybe $40. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But those, unlike, you know, if you're, if you're a 13 year old, 14 year old kid, that's, that's got a little more cash and you want to, and you, you know, a little about investment, <laughs> The bad monkey, yeah, it's going to have a low upfront cost, but when that jack breaks, it's landfill. The TS9 cost you 100 bucks, but when the right. jack breaks, you get it fixed for 20 bucks, and you still got an $80 pedal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> By the way, speaking of uh, warranties, I have to say I was impressed with uh, Fender. I had a uh, f- just a cable, Fender custom shop cable from them that went bad. Um, I wrote them. I sent the picture. I went to the support line on the thing. I sent them a picture of it. Got an email back from a guy and said that they were sending me a new cable out within seven to ten days. So I was like, "That's fantastic. That's all way too much work for me." <laughs> <laughs> I just fix well, it. <laughs> well, there you go. I, 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 I off solder new end on. I probably could fix it. I probably could, but I, you know, I figured it's a. It was a twenty. 20 foot pedal. I probably, I mean, a cord. I spent enough money on it. Just send me another one <laughs> and then I'll fix it. Then now I have to. There you go. <laughs> Didn't take too much time. I just found it online support, sent a, pic- a picture of it. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Row Camp 56 says, Can you still get a King of Tone pedal? Yes, you can. Uh, you sure you can. Wanna- if you're on the list, you can get one. Within a few days, once you reach the top. <laughs> in two years. In two, in two years, years unfortunately. <laughs> but hopefully you got on the list. And by the way, if you got on the list in 2005 and didn't order, we still have your email address. So just contact us and you can order it tomorrow and you'll get it next week. Um, as, long as, uh, as long as you've ever reached the top of the list, you can still get a pedal without waiting. Hmm, cool. Gotcha. Uh, Daniel Judge says, I'm on the list and it's almost two years. Can you check how long I have left? <laughs> yeah, actually, Analog Amy, I, I, I never did that. I didn't have time, but Analog Amy it will tell you, can confirm that you're on the list. Uh, if you send, send an email to kingoftonelist at gmail.com, Analog Amy will, will be happy to let you know. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, what not has a question. How is the pot and RDX 20 production different from stuff made in Connecticut? How's the, the what? So he says, how is the pot and RDX 20 production? Oh, okay. Prince of tone. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I, uh, my Japanese collaborator, Obayashi san, he's really, um, electrical genius. Um, he designs multi-million dollar power supplies for a company and <clears throat> his company sells them in, in China. And so he goes to China and talks, uh, you know, with, with the companies and uh, over there. So when he's in China, he, he goes to factories and he's able to meet people at these factories. And he found a, fa- a, a small factory that had high quality and they had one specific guy who, uh, he liked he liked his work, and this one guy builds our our Prince of Tone pedals um, by hand with you know solder, and then uh, ships them to us. Um, pretty much the same as we make the King of Tones over here, but but they're made in China, and uh, those are usually available on Wednesdays. Um, those are still tough to get, but we don't have a waiting list. But uh, when I have them available, I'll put them on the website. The website keeps. Um, tabs on how many we have in stock and allows you to order when we have them. Um, and the delay, delay is pretty much the same the delay. We also have Obayashi-san designed it in Japan and uh, we have that made by the same factory in China. Um, but then they have to send it to his shop in Japan for final calibration because delays have um, really sensitive calibration to get the delay chips right without any noise. 
um, either whistling or uh, ring modulator noises. So mm -hmm. he uh, he does those in his shop and then sends sends those to us. Okay. Um, CNC Tomatic wants to know what delay pedals do you use, Mike? I use our analog delay, the analog man um, ARDX20 analog delay, because uh, I kind of designed it for what I need. Is I have one delay that's a uh, short slap back, kind of like some people use reverb. I'll keep that on all, all the time. And it also acts as a really good buffer because our delay has a really good buffer in. So from my delay, it goes into my volume pedal. And that buffer will push it right through the volume pedal, right to my amp without losing any tone. And then I have the other side I'll set for longer delays for like solos or sometimes um, I'll set it for really strange things like for uh, uh, infinitely repeating kind of a reverb thing for, for some songs. So being able to switch between two settings, not just the delay time, but different amount of feedback and different volume um, mm -hmm. makes it perfect delay for me. So that's what I use, obviously. <laughs> The only pedal I have, you were mentioning the MXR Phase 90. One of the only pedals I, I use that I don't make is an MXR Phase 90 original, which, like you, I put the battery clip on it so I could plug it into my power supply. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to hurt the vintage value, so I put an LED that sticks out of the bottom plate and goes up on the side of the pedal and just it's held on with, with tape so I can see if it's on or off. Yeah. Ah. yeah. That's and, nice. Uh, we do put a lot pedals, uh, LEDs in a lot of pedals, like Wise, you mentioned yours has has an LED. And more than even just know, uh, knowing that they're on or off when you turn them on and off, the LED is very valuable for debugging. Sometimes you don't get any sound out of your pedal board. Having LEDs is makes it so much easier to figure out what's on, what's, yeah. what's what doesn't have power, what's off. So it, it is nice to have LEDs. You know what? I'll probably bring my pedal next time on my trip to Danbury. Maybe you can make that mod for me, put an LED so I can see it, you know. That would be cool. Um, yeah, because that is a pain in the ass. I'm like, is it on? I don't know if it's on. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like waiting for the swirl. I'm like, okay, it's on. All right, let me turn it off. Um, let's see. Whatnot has a, a good question. And it was kind of a question that you and I were talking about before, uh, Mike. Uh, so he says, do you guys see a decline in the gear market or just more competition? Oh, I, certainly no decline, um, at least in, in the pedal market. They're going stronger than ever, as, as far as I can tell. People are getting more and more into them. Um, companies, companies are coming out of the woodwork making more and more pedals. So there's definitely, uh, it's definitely harder if you're just getting into it. But, you know, if you're an established company, um, last, like, for example, last year, I was, I was just telling Mark last year was almost like before the, the crash of 2008, we sold a lot of shit. We, we just, our, my shipping guy was just shipping and shipping and shipping. And I was just printing out orders left and right. And, um, uh, people are just loving guitar pedals right now. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to cause when I started this business, I was like, okay, you know, how long am I going to do this? Five years, 10 years. You know, like when the Beatles started, they thought that they would be a band for three or four years. Nobody, nobody knew. Yeah, <laughs> right. And the uh, pedals are still going, man. People still like the analog stuff. And uh, we're different from, you know, most of the, these guys have gotten a, gone away from where we are. So we, we kind of stayed in the hand-built kind of limited supply dealing with the guy who almost builds your pedals. We're staying that way, and I can make a good enough living doing that. So... uh I'm I'm just happy that there are still people buying these and enjoying them, and people that can tell the difference between our pedals and something that's that's uh, made uh, alongside of your VCR remote control with the same parts. <laughs> right, <laughs> Not saying right. they're all like that, but there are some. <laughs> I'm sure there are. Yep, yep. There's a lot of cheap shit out there. Um, but no, it's great. Yeah, I definitely have to get my hands. And you see, the the tough part with the model is that because it's hard to get their your our hands. On, to try your products out in the store, right? Yeah, it is. That, it, that, that's tough. And, you know, all, all these, these new companies are so much better about making demos and promoting shit and getting Facebook and YouTube video <laughs> demos and going to all the shows and getting in all the stores. So you kind of have to, to work to get our stuff. And um, 
you know, I think that's kind of cool in a way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's old school. Yeah. And you, in, in the past, I mean, you know, Word there was mouth. no sound, sound clips when I started out. There were no videos. We had a cassette tape. I had a cassette tape I got from Bob Sweet playing uh, Two Rolling Stones um, on his Univibe. And it was a gr he used to send that out to people. If, if you contacted him from, Vin from Guitar Player Magazine, he'd send you that cassette and you could hear what the pedal sounded like. Mm -hmm. uh, right, then right, right. the internet came out. I took that cassette. I made a cable to go from my cassette player into my computer. And I recorded it into my computer, and that, you can still hear that sound clip from the uh, mid '90s, and uh, from cassette tape, and it sounds pretty good. <laughs> That's funny. That's so funny. But yeah, I mean, you got to kind of try our pedals. I mean, there are, now I'm really lucky, and I, I, I'm so proud of some of my my customers who put up these amazing demos. Uh, some of these guys are amazing players, and they have great gear. And when they, they put up a King of Tone demo or a Sunface demo or something, um, I really appreciate that. And I, I love seeing it. And I'll link to it on my, my Facebook page. Um, and a lot, some of these demoers, like Gearman Dude, uh, Mike Hermans, these guys didn't do this. They, in their first demos where they came to me and said, you know, Mike, I want to I wanna start doing demos or I, I think I can do demos. I'd send them their pedals and they would do the demos for me for free. And that kind of got them going. And now they do it almost for a living. I mean, people pay them to, yeah. to make video demos. And it's a lucrative market. There's like five or six guys who do tons of demos. And uh, people really, really enjoy watching them. Because, you know, who wants to watch TV at night? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find myself watching tons of stuff on YouTube, especially when traveling. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to throw on some YouTube while I'm sitting here in the airport. Get lost with it. You can really get lost. Going you can these demos, and you see something else on the right. Oh, yeah, you see on the right hand side. And you're like, oh, what's that? Click. Oh, right. That, yeah. That's a whole yeah. new screen of stuff, and you're like, boy. Oh, what's that? Click. Yep. <laughs> the whole rabbit hole. And then Dave, you got me down the, the the rabbit hole of reverb and being able to filter on like age ranges of shit. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like oh, let me look at pedals from you know the 70s to 1982. You know, like. Whatever's for sale there, I'm just like, oh, that's this is great. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, that's then, a great that's a great feature on Reverb. You can just search by era, you know. And, it is, and then you just you're just clicking through the pictures, and you're just like, oh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, I wonder how much Reverb actually has to do with the this boom in pedals because they uh, they just kind of whacked eBay and uh, they just took the market and they're just going getting getting huge yeah and uh people just, people go on there just for fun too and it's like i don't i don't sell on reverb um i've sold maybe five pedals in reverb and um i don't even like our dealers to sell on reverb because that's not it's not really adding value i want people to try our pedals you know go to the store and try them mm -hmm. you know if, if i want to sell pedals yeah, you, on reverb, well, i'll yeah, sell them you, on reverb you're <laughs> You're beating, you're beating a kind of a dead horse in some respects. I understand that you want people to go to the store and try the pedals, but a lot of people just don't want to. No, no. they just want yeah, to buy it online. Right, right. And in that case, you know, they try can, it they at could, home. They can come to my store and buy it. You know, yeah. if, if they want to do that. But uh, yeah, Reverb, Reverb is just taken off the the technology they have and the people they have there are, are doing a hell of a job. Uh -huh. Yep, and they're putting out a lot of different content too. They have articles and things. I mean, they're definitely kicking. It was a great idea. Then they have a, a whole other site for vinyl. I've noticed that lately. I get a yeah. lot of their spam about the vinyl. Yeah, it's interesting. Very good timing, yeah. I think, because it looks like vinyl is definitely uh, on the upswing right now. Yeah, big time. I didn't realize that. So they have reverb for vinyl. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> They're taking over the world. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, like you were talking about last time, I didn't realize that Toman is coming into the United States. Yeah. Which is, that's a whole other thing. You can go now and buy something. So it's like Toman's website. It's for the U.S. Yeah. Amazing. Crazy. Um, all right. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, any analog man metal zone mods from Aaron Cram? Certainly, that that um, I don't know if it was a joke, but there 
there's kind of an old joke going around anytime anybody asks what's the best flanger metal zone what's the best but anyway metal yeah. zone <laughs> is you know the japanese kids who it was made for they love it they love that over the top you know distorted crazy high frequency sound but um personally it's it's way over the top for me and even when i love i love metal uh certain a lot of metal music and uh i don't want it to be that fake sound and so we i looked at the circuit and studied it. they have these like gyrator circuits in there which just do too much so i just kind of tweaked them in, in the different frequencies and gave it a, like a bit of a respectable haircut and um i find the metal, metal zone with our mod is quite usable for you know everything from you know some 70s rock to to pretty hard metal Hmm. without sounding like a cheap pedal right that's cool um so we had a question from shield dk1 lothbrook he says nice t-shirt mark mr friedman never replied to my email inquiring about those shirts i already, I already answered i already answered oh i was gonna say i'm sure if you email back or he'll yeah i asked back. i asked him to already so okay all right there you go yes i'm sure you'll get taken care of um Here's, well, a here's one. Here's one. Yeah. Vintage sounds. Are you ever going to design your own pickups? What do you think's in our guitars? There you go. <laughs> so the answer is yes, and they'll actually be available aftermarket. Um, I have seen the boxes, so that means any minute now. Okay. We've got our own pickups too. The uh, Lindy Frail and Jim Weeder. Uh, Big T Telecaster pickups. If you want a vintage Telecaster tone, they're they're killer because Jim Jim knows what his tele sounds like, and he spent months going back and forth with Lindy with trying half. Uh, you know, there's like a 42 gauge, there's a 41 gauge. He's like, ah, can you do, find a 41 and a half gauge wire? And he would find it and make the magnets a little bigger, a little little slower. And we got the uh, got that neck pick of the tele nice and strong to match the bridge really well and then after that started selling well we came out with a matching bridge because some people were like well why don't you sell a set so we made a bridge that sounds just like he's 52 hmm. oh cool yeah, yeah lindy vrillin legendary pickup maker i uh, love his pickups yeah yeah great. Well, back when i was dealing vintage guitars every time i got a, a guitar in with bad pickups in the 90s i would send him the pickup oh, absolutely. Lines he's, and, he's the he's the originator He's yep. the king. Well, Seymour Duncan, I guess, was before right. him, but but Lindy was the king of that all in the '90s and stuff. Yeah, he, I call him like the first boutique pedal builder, so to speak. You know, you mean and, pick up, uh, pick up builder? Still, they sound amazing, all of them. Yeah, his yep. pickups. So I'm I'm not trying his humbuckers, but his single coil. Oh, they're good. The hums are good. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, our next guest is going to be. Uh, Wade from Motor City Pickups, which will be Yeeha, cool. my buddy. Yeah, be cool. I have to work everything out with him. Um, so let's see. Uh, we had there was one other question here. Oh, about any new gear coming out? Anything for me? Uh, or yes. for who? Uh, probably for both of you. Oh geez, uh, well, finally the Waz coming out. Finally, the Golden Pearl is going to be coming out. Finally, the Beod Deluxe is coming out. Um, meaning actually shipping. So that stuff will be available in the next varying times. So Wa end of the September, and the other one staggered out after that. Pickups somewhere in there too. Okay. Oh, something um, else too. I've oh yeah, the, the Mike No More. Mike No More, yes. Uh, Mike No More, what's that? The cabinet emulated DI box. Oh, nice. Yeah, analog one. Very uh, nice. Digital. Sounds good that we use it in another amp of ours that we have, and uh, people seem to like it. And I think it's going to be ninety nine bucks too. That's a good how price. Can you not, how can you not get one? <laughs> yeah, that's a good price. So, Exactly. 
Dr. Cheeseburger has a good question here. He says, I'm sort of a fuzz version of sorts. So I have a Germini, Germino Club 40, Marshall JMP 50 clone, mainly use Les Pauls, but also use a Strat. What fuzz pedal would you recommend? Play rock, country, and blues. Well, that depends on what he wants to do with that fuzz. Does he just want to use it kind of for, for big, fat solos, like a Gilmore thing? Or does he want to use it for rhythm guitar or somewhere in between? Um, if you want to get a fuzzy kind of rhythm guitar with the Les Paul, something like the Astrotone fuzz is great, especially for, for a guy who isn't that used to fuzz because it's, it's kind of like a fuzzy overdrive almost. And um, it, it's easy to use, no temperature problems. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, but if you want to get the, those big Gilmore leads, it's not, it's not going to do it unless you maybe boost it with another pedal. Um, but then, you know, a, a sun face is going to be great for those, those big leads. And also by using the volume control on your guitar, you can get it cleaned up. You can just use it for dirty rhythm, but they're a lot harder to use. It's going to, it's going to take some time fiddling with the guitars. You're not going to be able to put any buffers in front of it. So if you've got a tuner there in the beginning of your board, you're going to have to move that after the fuzz um so it really depends on what kind of sounds what kind of music you're, you're playing and what you what you want to get out of the fuzz there's a lot of different answers there's no there's no bad pedal there's only a bad usage of a pedal okay one thing that you, you uh someone asked about new things and um i i actually got a couple of new new things in my hand that i haven't posted or even talked about yet but um thanks to joel from uh from Chase Bliss, we got these larger size mini boxes. And I've never been a big fan of mini pedals because um, my foot is a lot bigger than that. And um, <laughs> <laughs> if I have them on my board, I'm not going to be able to turn them on and off. But, you know, they're nice on the en ends of the boards. Like I've got a, a mini Bina boost on the end of my board I can hit. And if you're making a really small travel board, they're nice and light. Um, but the reason I didn't like them is because they don't normally fit batteries. But... Um, we were able to get some of these cases thanks to uh, to Joel, and now we can put a battery hmm. inside of our uh, mini bad Bob pedal. So you can either run it off the power jack, or you can put the battery in it. And um, the other other little mini pedal, you know, we can make a lot more. But uh, the first two we made is this is a little mini buffer, and these are just great tools to have around. Um, if you're having any issues, you can try putting it in different parts of your board. And this one now can fit a battery inside, so uh, mm. so it, it's very convenient. And those are the first two that we made in, in these cases, and they're about the same height as a uh, our tall box sun face. They're a little taller than our than our normal sun face or sun bender, but um, you know, not a mm. lot different. <laughs> no, not at all. So That's th cool. these are pretty cool. Yeah. Are you going to be making any other pedals in that same size? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to. Now that we've got a little more room, you know, um, who knows? Maybe a mini, mini Sunface. Uh, get some of these made gold and come out with a with a mini Sunface. I mean, a lot of people like their uh, keep their fuzz knob up all the way, so that could maybe be a trim pot or just remove it completely. Um, try to simplify it, make it smaller, and it can fit a battery in there. That would be a nice one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, David Vivar says, hey, Dave, thanks for modding my butter slocks. It sounds killer. Oh, cool. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, someone had a, a question about what's the difference with here, uh, Spot MFD. What's the difference between a Prince of Tone and King of Tone? Well, um, came out with the King of Tone first, and then when I wanted to get the uh, – uh, get them mass produced a little bit so that maybe try to help our King of Tone list and try to get them into more players' hands. We had um, my partner Obayashi design them and make them in China. And uh, he used my same schematic and uh, the same, we used the same chip. We used the same clipping diodes, which haven't been made in uh, several years. Um, so it's pretty much identical to the King of Tone with the higher gain option, which just gives you a couple more notches on the drive knob. So it's, it's pretty much the same as that. The differences are the Prince of Tone distortion mode is a little better. The King of Tone distortion mode is a little kind of wimpy. 
the Princetone is in a little beefier distortion mode. And the Princetone has two additional trim pots on the inside. One gives you a little more lower mids. It's subtle, but, but some people like it. And then the other one gives you a little more uh, kind of saturation when you're in the, in the distortion mode and just makes it sound a little, a little cool or a little more distortion-y. But other than that, they're the same. If you get two Prince of Tones side by side, you pretty much have a King of Tone. Gotcha. Okay. Um, a Lullaby wanted to know, where did Freeman get their guitar necks made? And you want to answer that, Dave, or you want me to? Um, they're made uh, in Grover Jackson's shop where the bodies are made and where the pickups are made. That covers a bunch of questions <laughs> that were asked by a few people. So everything's made in-house. It's not outsourced anything. So uh, Grover and I make these guitars, and it's all made at his, at his factory. Yep. Uh, had a comment from uh, Caleb Rapport. Great show, Mark. Thanks, man. Uh, and Dave Nesdahl, thanks for watching, guys. Um, yeah, you guys should definitely try the Friedman guitars. They are freaking killer. I mean, can you ask for a better guitar being made by Grover Jackson? Huh? Seriously. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's any other questions. I know we're running long. Oh, on someone time. asked about the... Uh lists for my pedals um only the king of tone has a waiting list we used to have a waiting list for the bi comp but that one ended a long time ago and um other pedals pretty much you just order them and some of them take a little while to build but if you can add it to your cart then you can get a pedal for example the prince of tones if we don't have any in stock you try to add it to the cart it will uh, it won't allow you to but for like say a bino boost you put choose your options, add it to the cart, and then we get your order, we start building it. Those can take a couple of weeks to build, but there's no waiting list. Other pedals, like the modified pedals, um, we get your order and we can modify them. Like I said, my mod guy keeps up, so we can get it out maybe the next day, maybe two days. Um, some things will, will go out the same day or the next day if we happen. Like right now, I have two envelope filters on the shelf. Um, we ship probably a half dozen of them today. Those people waited maybe a week or a few days, but you know, we to do them in batches because you, you can't make one pedal at a time. You just can't. We would we would go broke really fast. We at least have to make them in batches to make them a little more efficient. All right, all right, gotcha. So Vinny Moretti, Vinny Moretti had a question. <laughs> because Dave, are the where are the trees grown for the wood of your guitars? <laughs> <laughs> They're made in the North Pole by little elves. <laughs> oh, I was going to say the swamp, swamp ash. <laughs> oh, they, everybody wants to know all the details. Um, what is the bad Bob? Can you describe it and what makes it special? Yeah, the bad Bob um, is a booster pedal, the bad Bob boost. And uh, yeah, that was that, that little guy here. We also make a a bigger version actually i think i have one over, oh, i can't reach it with these short things but uh make a regular mxr size version too with nice color graphics on it and it was designed the original the circuit was designed by um jack from amz effects uh it's a nice two fet circuit uh it's a look it's gritty it's not really clean it's kind of a gritty boost and then robbie wallace tuned that circuit um choosing the slightly different capacitors and also choosing the gains of the but so one thing we do on the sun face is all these transistors will have little uh little numbers on them which is the the gain value hmm. and so for the bad bobs also we 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 match the fets to certain gain values and it's just it just is a great booster pedal it makes almost any amp sing really well um it's got good low end it's got good high end um it's got that kind of crunchiness that i that i like to cut through with the band and it's it's a great thing to stack um like i showed you before we, we recently came up with a dual bad bob which is two of them you can stack them together you run the, the first one high and then use the second one low it's kind of master volume so it's not too loud right and it's just like it's like a neil young kind of a blown up fuzz with a with a um deluxe tweed deluxe with some sort of a fuzz going into it it's just a really cool sound so you can stack them that way or i like to run it 
after like a king of tone i'll run a bino boost someone asked um what's my favorite classic rock tone and that would be um the bino boost into a king of tone but then to have a bad bob after that to take it up another notch or for like the end of the solo or something is really nice very cool i don't know if you want me to make any noise but i do have the the pedals here i could for a few seconds i could play something and show you what what the different pedals do let's give it a shot see how it sounds <laughs> uh, it's gonna come through but yeah, yeah it's not it's not too loud I, I did a little video before but uh it shouldn't be too distorted but basically it's my clean sound that's the uh pro junior on like two and a half and give it a little bit of delay so it's not too boring and then you give it the prince of tone this is my uh telly prince of tone you'll get less too much dis delay prince of tone will give you that a little bit of overdrive and then you hit it with the bino and that kind of takes it to that next level of classic rock and gives you that little bit of a frequency boost I'm sure you've heard that kind of a sound a lot right. and then if you're playing and you want to go up a notch you can hit the bad bob that's all three without the bad bob without the bino and clean so maybe right right, right. I, yeah it was i could tell the difference when you got when you put the bad bob on, it got very compressed. Yeah, probably some of that was probably the the technology here. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like you, like you mentioned, yeah. Also, YouTube compresses stuff, so people say, "Why don't you put a lot, a lot of YouTube demos?" Well, you can't hear the pedal on YouTube. You can't really hear what it's doing that good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's tough. You got to get a good, really good recording. Um, there was a question that I saw. Uh, Analog Man modded B two B D two blues driver. Do you do that? Yeah, we we um, we've done a lot of those B D two mods. That's another pedal that um, was designed for the Japanese players who like that kind of bright, high end kind of fuzzy sound. But um, the people over here tend to like a little bit of a warmer sound, smoother sound. So uh, that's another one I worked on with Obayashi San. I would try some things here. I'd email them. I, you know, I work till like 1130 at night, sometimes midnight. And I'll, at the end of the day, I would email him, tell him what I did. And he would try it. And then next day, I'd come into work and I'd see what he did. And we'd work together and uh, try to make it sound good, changing the chips, changing a bunch of capacitor, changing the clipping. And uh, just made it sound a whole lot less like a pedal and more like what the BD-2 is, is so good at. The BD-2 can, can be really nice and clean and it can be really fuzzy, too. And it does that without doing the uh, Tube Screamer thing of excessive compression and mid-range. So now we made that whole range more usable and less like a pedal. Unfortunately, the BD-2s, like the SD-1s, have been uh, changed to surface mount technology and we can no longer modify them. They don't have any available to us that have the old boards. Where the DS-1s, they have the black ones still. And the black ones have got the old board and I've got... I've got, I don't know, 500 of those in stock in case they run out. And the SD ones, I think those change too, but I've got several hundred of those in stock, so we can still modify mm. those. But the BD2s, unfortunately, they, they ran out of those before they told me that they were changing to uh, surface mount technology. So if you want to get a modified blue driver, just get one and send it to us. And our website has a picture of the power jack, so you can see if it's the old version that we can modify or not and it's based on if the power jack is like in the middle of the pedal or if it's like on the edge on the bottom plate mm. okay uh ken stowe has a question for dave is there much difference between a tube rectifier and a solid state as far as sound not really i mean it's a little it's a little different the tube will sag a little bit and it'll it'll, it'll give you a little bit of a saggy sound but the 5 air 4 and a solid state rectifier is, they're pretty close still there's a little difference just a little rounder a little saggier by the way uh vinny vinny's too funny <laughs> did, did you see the, all those posts that were going up on the freeman page dave yeah did, did on the freedman page 
Yeah. Uh, or on, on, on the chat. On, on, no, on Facebook. No. Recently, where a guy would post. Oh, yeah, video. yeah, yeah. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like Vinny wrote. Uh, in the Friedman user group or something. Yeah, Dave, does the BE50 get the same creamy, creamy luscious tones of the Mezzo Boogie Mark V? <laughs> Uh, yeah 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 uh, is it like a wizard is it like this amp oh my god that guy was driving everybody nuts. did you see my comment in the chat to to <laughs> everyone was talking about the guitars in the woods and this and that and the, who, you yes know, where they are and what did i say <laughs> I, I said uh elf loggers cut the trees they reside in elf land but because of the tariffs, we may have to switch to Fairyland to avoid price increases. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, <laughs> those tariffs, those damn tariffs. Oh, by the way, um, sad news about Ed Ed King passing away. Oh, very yeah. sad. He was a he was a heck, a heck of a guy. Great player. Great player. Such, such a long time too. Yeah, I used to. You know, he was like one of these guys who was on the internet. Way early on the Les Paul forum. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. It was so cool to see someone like him on the forum. Yeah, and I mean, I, I was part of the Les Paul forum years, and you went like, you know, when it just first started, and um, and there's Ed King, you know, talking about his vintage Les Pauls and shit. You know, like, okay, how cool is that? So, seemed like a really decent guy, great player. So that's sad. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention. So, Dave, I told you, and Mike, I, don't, I didn't tell you this uh, since we just met the other day. Um, I came up with this idea, clearly, that was not the first idea in the world, um, that on the Floyd Trem bar, um, I always felt like I hated grabbing onto metal, you know? So I came up with this idea of putting, like, a rubber grip on it and um, I looked it up, and I couldn't find anybody who made one. So I started going down down the path of actually making one. Uh, and then talking to a friend, he was like, have you heard of T-Snub? I'm like, I have not heard of T-Snub. So I looked them up, and sure enough, this is a company that makes uh, this rubber grip that goes onto a Floyd bar. And... Uh, it was super easy to go on and just use a little bit of water to put the put your bar through it. And um, I've used it on a couple of guitars already, and I think it's super cool. Um, it's almost like a uh, I don't know, like a shift bar for your for your car, right? You know, you get a little rubber grip. I like it. It makes it easier to play. I don't know if anybody's into it. I know Dave, you said you didn't really care for it. Yeah, I don't want something on mine like that so <laughs> but hey if you if you if if you like that that's fine i like it i actually i think just having that's that that's that's great that's fine yeah yeah you know i i, I prefer the the vintage style trim on a strat you know mm -hmm. or at least the way the bar feels with the the little grip on there so anyway anybody wants to check it out check out t-snub I told the guy I'd mentioned his product because I thought it was really cool. And plus, uh, he, he stole my idea. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he did it before <laughs> me. <laughs> he did it before me. So I had to concede that uh, it was not worth my time. But I, I bought four of them from him. So so it's cool. So Ice, was, coffee tones goes, Ice Coffee Tone says, wear a rubber glove in your picking hand. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You could do that. I could be like oh, a, no 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 George Lynch. What? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I actually did? If you really don't want to do something like this, if you don't want to buy the product, I actually um, I went out to uh, Home Depot and there's Plasti Dip. Yeah, which is basically just you know you just yeah they dip tool handles in right tool handles and stuff. I just yeah. took it and dipped it in there a few times and then boom, you have rubber dip on your a rubber grip on your thing, but. I, I like the product. It's cool. Um, so check it out, guys. T Snub. I'm not big on the name. I think the name's weird. <laughs> but I already told him that. But what, what what am I? I'm not a marketing genius, but I think the name could be better. <laughs> so uh, let's see. What else? Heat shrink, someone said. 
so your fingers don't get pregnant while you're playing. Yeah, basically, yeah. it's a bar condom. That's basically yeah. what it is. Exactly. I was going to be the 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 uh, bar condom king of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Mike! How long is the waiting list for an analog man amp? With a smile. <laughs> how old are you? <laughs> what is the average life expectancy in your state? Um, yeah. Hi. I'm just too busy to even think about an amp, but um, uh, I mean, there are a lot of guys like Dave making great amps now, but um, I, I don't see any reason, any need to do to do so. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's a whammy rubber. Yes, that was that was not the actual name I was going for, but that it's pretty good. I actually like it. Just it's the whammy rubber. <laughs> Should it be ribbed for your pleasure? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. Yeah, silicone tape would work good. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different choices. Um, I just always found like, and I'm not playing live anymore, but when I would go to grab the bar live, it would slip out of my hands. I've had that happen sometimes. Um, let's see. Did that guy get blocked yet? Oh, who was that? That's the guy in the whatever the Friedman form. Oh, <laughs> Friedman uh, or Friedman user group form or whatever. Uh, Ed Van H Eddie Van Hendrick says this tone talk pedal discussion with Mike Pierre is really the end all be all. No sense having any other pedal maker on after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's All interesting. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think I've gone through all the questions, and it's been quite a great discussion with you. Oh, we got one last question. Johnny Rial, what do you think of the new Fender pedals? I haven't tried them. I saw them at uh, NAM. I haven't tried them either. I third that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I've... we don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what is your go-to amp? CNC wants to know. That's a good question. Um, I love a lot of different amps. Uh, I, I have pretty much every every type of amp in my collection. Um, I was using a deluxe reverb for years as my number one amp because they're just so such a good basic amp that we can use at any volume I would need, and they take pedals so well. Um, so that that kind of was my number one for a while. And I also have a Vox AC15. It's just a crappy Chinese, you know. I forget what they call it, AC30, AC15C1 or something. But yeah. it's the basic amp. But I put a Celestian Blue in it. Um, Mitch mm. Colby gave me one, thanks so much. He had one laying around. And boy, that kind of brought it alive. And a couple of deep, more decent tubes, some JJ tubes in it. Um, and it's a, the guys in my band, they, they love when I play through the amp, the amp. They just say it sounds great. And, and it does. Um, it's got more compression than than the deluxe, so I have to adjust my delay settings down. The uh, level and the repeats have to come down a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's that's a fun that's a fun amp. But lately, I've been using a trainer amp. It's called a mini mini mate or something. It's a little kind of like a 18 watt two EL84 amp combo with 112. And I bought it at a uh, at an auction. A recording studio auction and the guy modified it he added a tube rectifier to it and i added a big reverb tank to it and it's just a great sounding little amp it's got just the right amount of compression it's got really active tone controls unlike a fender or marshall the tone controls in the trainer actually do something and you know just moving the knob between three and four makes a big difference i have to find that frequency mm -hmm. um and that works well with my band because it's just loud enough so they can turn it up to like four where it's starting to work and it's not too loud. So I've been using that a lot lately, but I think my, my bandmates seem to like the AC-15 best. <laughs> That's cool. No Friedmans. Don't have any of those yet, but what, what, do, you, what do you recommend? Do you like those JJ tubes in the, the Vox amp? Uh, in a Vox, uh, in a Vox uh, for the E-84s? AC yeah, and um, the, and the pre the preamp tubes, and, no, mm, but mostly mostly mm. the EL eighty fours. Well, I mean, for EL eighty fours, you got Soft Tech or you have JJ's. Um, JJ's sound a little uh, punchier, a little stiffer, and the Soft Techs will have a little more compression to them. 
Yeah, that's probably so, a, well. I like the JJ's. I don't want it to be too compressed. It's already pretty compressed for me. Okay, then to, probably the JJ the power tubes. Yeah, I don't yeah, really I, I like the JJ those. preamp tubes that much. Um, generally speaking, we use Chinese preamp tubes because they're probably the most reliable and best thing on the market right now. Really? Um, yeah, really are. Um, what brands and anything in particular? Or? Well, we get them rebranded from a company in California from ARS Electronics, but you okay. can get them from Ruby. You can get them from, uh, you can, if you buy stuff from CE Distribution, you probably do it sometime. Right, right. You can right. get um, Sino Chinese 12AX7Bs. They're just Chinese 12AX7s. Those are good. Sometimes you can't use them in the first slot if you're overdriving the amp mm. and getting it up there a lot. I mean, if you're cleaner, you can probably get away with it. Uh, I was lucky so to first slot. Sometimes I put a JJ just because the low microphonics I do in my amps in, in production. In production, and what you can find to work for one amp is a whole different story. Yeah, for for personally, you know, I've I've been doing this for a long time, and I've got a big stash of vintage tubes. So I pretty much yeah, have new old stock preamp tubes. Yeah. You, you and can, even you like can, yeah, like fifteen years ago, New Sensor found a big stash of actual Mullard. 12 at 7 so i bought 20 yeah. of them and i still have 10 of them yeah. <laughs> so all my amps have new old stock muller 8 12 at 7s how can you beat that <laughs> yeah you, you can. can't really yeah you really can't although some, sometimes old tubes aren't all they they're cracked up to be sometimes they're plagued with problems also and 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 you know noisy and it's you just gotta hunt and pack if you're just picking some old tubes for your amp right you just listen and see what sounds good yeah like That's that sound of that 12 x 7 in the it. first slot Ooh, that one's cool that's in the, the very first it. slot of the amp, try seven, eight, nine, ten tubes of yeah, very. I like using my li my little champ amp for, for you know testing yeah. the preamp tubes because you yeah. can just put the tube in there and and basically get a pretty good idea how yeah. it's going to sound and throw out the bad ones. And if you got a good one, you can try it in the Vox or try it in I, the Vox. I I unfortunately don't have the luxury of doing that much anymore. So it's just like I I make such big production of amps. It's like. What's new that I can use that's going to work and sound great and be reliable? Be reliable. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. That's the main thing. If it sounds a little worse, but it'll last, you know, at least through the warranty period, that's what you need. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been down that path with the EO34s. I've, I've, there was a short period in time where I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm switching every amp to 5881s. <laughs> like Marshall did in the mid 70s. Yeah, yeah, this country. yeah. Well, they uh, well, they went to 6550s because the same problems they had, see, the, the problems existed even back then. You know, it, it's, it's so. Uh, luckily, we've, we've worked it out where we found something we like now. So mm -hmm. nice. By the way, we have 200 viewers right now. Oh, that's great. We've had a consistent run of oh, over 200 people watching um aaron cram says does mike own any electronic gear that is bone stock oh <laughs> uh, yeah i mean um like i use well yeah actually i kind of kind of do modify stuff i didn't think of it that way but even like an, another pedal on my own pedal board that i didn't build is the electro harmonics c9 uh the or organ machine kind of it does oh yeah the synths and the organs and mellotrons and i couldn't leave it stocked because <laughs> first of all the buy wait a minute i didn't like but the c9 organ thing isn't that the one that has the annoying problem there i ran into a problem on one of those where if it's powered with a power supply and then you just power up the board while it's plugged into the power supply it will come up dead. It like just doesn't doesn't turn on. You unplug the power cable, plug it back in, and you're good to go. I have noticed things like that with it. It is a little yeah. weird, and I didn't like the bypass on it at all. When it was off, it was I didn't like it. Also, I did a true bypass mod, but then even with the true bypass mod, if you have the power jack plugged into it, you'll get bleed through of the digital noise. So. Mm -hmm. I actually unplug mine when I'm not using it. It's true bypass, and I pull the power jack off, and I use it on, I don't know, four or five songs, and I'll reach over and plug the power jack <laughs> in. Especially if you have a compressor after it, the compressor will pick up the uh, that digital... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That noise, and it just drives me crazy. So I have you, modified that. Do you have a buffer before the front of it? I do not. 
if you put a buffer before the front of it, you might get rid of the digital noise because the high impedance guitar near near the digital circuit with your true bypass wires, I'm not exactly sure how you wired it, uh, will sorry. pick up stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, I have that before some of my fuzzes, so I can't really put a buffer before it for when it's There you off. go. There's the problem. But maybe if I move it down the pedal board, because my King of Tone actually has a, has a buffer in it. That's another option we have in the King of Tone. If I ran it after the King of Tone, then it would have a buffer. But I like to run the organ thing into the King of Tone sometimes and get a distorted organ sound. So, yeah, it's all it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, as I mentioned, my MXR pedal is modified. Um, most of my guitars are, are modified. My, my number one guitar is a 99 Gibson 59 reissue, and I have very early 60 pre-patent number, uh, or patent number pre-T-top in the bridge and a patent number T-top in the neck and 1958 capacitors and better pots. So that's modified. Um, my Tele, I use a 68 Tele, and it's got our big T pickups in it, so that's modified. So yeah, I don't play too much stock gear. <laughs> yeah. Of course. What about not. you, Dave? You have anything stock besides even your Plexi is probably modified, right? Uh, Plexi. Well, I mean it's I mean relatively stock, but it's not the original. Mm. Um, yeah, no, not generally not. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. Um Let's see. We had one other good question here. There's plenty of questions, but uh, what? Uh, maybe I'm, I lost it. But it was a question about the difference between um, Alnico and ceramic pickups. I mean, uh, uh, speakers. Oh, oh Here's boy! Th Can you talk about speakers, Alnico versus ceramic, whatnot? Well, this. Here, here's an answer for you. They sound different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? That's a really hard one just to put in words. Because really, in order to really test that theory, you'd have to, you know, swap the magnet on a speaker, um, which is not something you'll do. Um, right. Because the whole speaker's design is different. So how do you compare? You know? I mean, a Vox Blue is an Alnico speaker. Uh, it's it's made by Celestion. Um, so uh, how is it different from a Greenback? Well, I don't know. How is a Greenback different from a Vintage Thirty? They're all they're all just different design speakers with different voice coils and different things. That's really hard to just nail down. Like on a pickup, it's easier. You can go, okay, Alnico Two Magnet is a sweeter sounding. More rolled off in the top end. El Nico Five is a brighter sound. El Nico Four, somewhere between the two. You know, it's easier. It's easier to differentiate in a pickup, but a speaker—that's tough. Yeah. What you doing, Mike? <laughs> I saw someone ask, "What's my favorite envelope filter?" So instead of you know telling them, I thought I, they could hear it. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, let's but hear. But of course, I lost my pick. And I, I can't really play anyway, so I guess it doesn't make much difference. But uh, my favorite envelope filter is the uh, analog man envelope filter because it's very easy to use. You just put all the knobs at noon and it does the envelope. There. And it has the down too, like the, the Mutron up down switch. You can do the. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> That's my, my favorite. favorite would be the the original Ibanez AF two hundred one uh, was it? Is that correct? Yeah, 201? the eight hundred eight series. That was really the eight hundred eight nice. series envelope filter. That's really nasty. I like that one. They kind of copied the, the Mutron features on it and made it a nice, small, compact pedal. Yeah, those, those were nice. And I, and I don't hate the um, the original DoD one. The yeah, green, the green, green one. Box. Yeah, those were quite good. Yeah, uh, but of course, a Mutron's cool, but that's uh, I almost that's like almost a little different class, a different kind of yeah. style of envelope filter, sort of. Ours I think Grateful based, Dead when I do ours is based on the MXR, obviously, and yeah. um, it doesn't it's not as thick and kind of syrupy as that. It's more like a nice uh, bright auto lock kind of thing. Right, right. Peter Griffin said, "Sounds like some '70s porn." 
<laughs> yeah, that's the yep. loss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it's good stuff. Um, oh, someone mentioned the Gaiatone envelope filter, the old little one. That, that yeah. was pretty cool, too. That wah, little green one. rocker or something? The wah, wah rocker, yes, WR2. Yeah. yeah. I actually the found purple. out about those when I was in Japan in the 80s. There was some Japanese guy um, using them and pushing them. I grabbed one. They were like $20 in Japan at the time. I brought them home, and um, I started importing them. And uh, Kevin, um, who is now runs Godlike and, he, and Maxon, Wonderful. he's the Maxon importer, he, found, he, he saw them and, and saw they were pretty cool and uh, contacted them over there, and he became their, their importer after, after checking them out. Right. I know Kevin. They were a really simple. Kevin Gollenbach. They yes. were a really simple little pedal, and they sounded great. They sounded big. Cool. All right. Well, it's just hit midnight. I've got work tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to call it a night. Uh, I want to thank you, Mike, for coming on, man. And uh, it's been an awesome three-hour conversation with you. I appreciate it. Thank you much, so much for inviting me. Time flies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just like went, went by like that with lots of great questions. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, everybody, thank you. Really appreciate it. Please hit the subscribe button. Um, and uh, we also still have Tone Talk t-shirts. So if anybody's interested in a Tone Talk t-shirt, hit me up. But hit the subscribe button. And, Mike, where can people reach you? Please tell them. Oh, Google. <laughs> I always tell people Google's you your friend our, our mod form just Google for our mod form I'm going to replace from Google for it if you want my email address Google for it but yeah I'm at uh, analogman.com analog mic and uh, love to hear from you we'll help you out we'll get you, help you get those tones and thanks so much for, for hanging out and watching yeah thank you alright Dave any last thanks, comments everyone. uh no <laughs> I, I was trying to think of something witty about the uh, the elves and the uh, and the fairies, you know, but I, I I couldn't come up with anything this time. <laughs> That's right. Does the BE fifty sound like the wizard? That's what I want to know. <sighs> <laughs> All right. Well, guys, have a great night. And uh, only we... only if you stand on your head and and play your guitar left handed. Hey, well, I, that won't be hard for me, except for the uh, standing on your head part. Standing my head, my head part. Yeah, exactly. While playing, yes, that would be. Think hard. about that concept for a minute. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. <laughs> oh, by the way, next Friday, next Friday, whatever date that is, I think it's. Uh, hang on, next Friday the thirty. Next Friday already. Yeah, we're doing? next. That's when we're doing it. Friday the thirty first. Oh, so we're. We're like really, really running these shows quick here. Yeah, we're back to back. Um, that works for you, right? Yeah, it'll it'll work. Sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, because that I mean, was... unless you want to put it to the following week. Um, I can ask him. I can see if Wade if that works for Wade. But um, all right, I'll check with Wade. It's like if we do shows every week, we have to come up with guests. I know so that's the thing. So I mean, fast. Our thing, you, you know, the thing is, get off for a month. <laughs> we we may have to. That's the way. When whenever we get a guest, that's when we'll do the show. We're not going to yeah. push it, you know. So, um, I'll check with Wade see if he can wait an extra week. But um, but again, guys, have a great great week, great rest of the week, and uh, your Friday and weekend, and uh, we'll talk soon. Oh Mike. wait, wait. There's one last thing. What's Again, that? He just had a great comment. We're gonna dig a hole in the ice. Drown all the elves and make the North Pole great again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, all right. And on that note, <laughs> we'll make your tone great again. <laughs> exactly. That is make tone great again. All right, guys. Have a great night. All right. We'll talk to you later. Good night. Thank talk you. To you Bye. later.